Astonishing Legends would like to thank Noom, Wondrium, Liquid IV, Stamps.com, ZocDoc, Simply Safe, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. There are many mysteries in the known universe, but some of the ones that seem to intrigue humanity most are about our own origins. Where do we come from? How did we become what we are today? According to author Charles Stanish, when archaeologists attempt to unravel our past and establish a chronology of our history, they often develop two types of timelines, evolutionary and historical. In his book, Ancient Titicaca, The Evolution of Complex Society in Southern Peru and Northern Bolivia, he points out on page 85 that evolutionary chronologies can also be described as developmental and are made of stages that define a set of cultural features common to all societies within that stage. In contrast, historical frameworks are chronological and are traditionally composed of absolute time periods. It's much more complex than that, and after further explanation on it, he's careful to point out that these chronologies are not truths to be discovered, but hypotheses to be tested. Of course, along the way, every culture discovers technology. When many of us think of that word, the first things that may come to mind are our smartphones, computers, and electronics. But technology is so much more than that. According to Merriam-Webster, the first definition of technology is the practical application of knowledge, especially in a particular area. In this way, technology can overlap with engineering, the application of science and mathematics by which matters, properties, and energy sources in nature are made useful to people. By these definitions, any tool, even something as simple as a hammer, is technology. Mayan technology, for example, was not smartphones and power tools. We know they used chisels. They might have also used more sophisticated methods of mechanical advantage, levers, fulcrums, or other carving tools. This brings us to tonight's topic, a masterfully constructed ceremonial and residential complex known as Pumapunku. First written about in 1549 by the Spanish conquistador Pedro Cieza de Leon, a complex of monuments so well built and engineered that the methods they were made with remain a mystery to this day. Interlocking blocks of stone, designed in a way that is so precise, they look out of place impossibly contemporary and even stylistically anachronistic in their appearance. After all, they're thought to have been initially created up to 3,000 years ago. The first archaeologists in the area thought it might have been occupied for 17,000 years. What's more, the heaviest of the stones is over 130 tons. How did they get these stones into place? When we look back at the history of humankind, we like to think that humanity has been on a continuous path of development since its inception, especially in a technological way. But what if that path wasn't continuous? What if our ancestors had excellent knowledge of engineering techniques and mathematics that was far beyond what we ever dreamed was available to them? And what if instead of that information being passed on to future generations, it was lost to time when they ceased to exist? forcing ensuing societies and cultures to start over from nothing. Pumapunku was once a thriving part of a larger site known as Tiwanaku. Some archaeologists think that there may have been as many as 400,000 people living in the area at one point. But about a thousand years ago, it was abandoned. Crops were left unharvested. Sophisticated building technology was seemingly lost forever. Why? Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. Life has been often disturbed on this earth by terrible events. Numberless living beings have been the victims of these catastrophes. Some have been destroyed by sudden inundations. Their races even have become extinct and have left no memorial of them except some small fragments which the naturalist can scarcely recognize. Excerpted from an 1812 quote by Baron Georges Cuvier, French zoologist, statesman, anatomist, and paleontologist. Join us tonight for part one of our two-part series on Puma Punku. And we're back. That we are, contrary to unpopular opinion. Oh, <laughs> well, folks, we have some quick but exciting things to share 
Before we get started tonight, firstly, we've launched a new Patreon exclusive show that is, well, it's different. <laughs> it's us, make no mistake, but it's a very different format from the main show, and it's called Astonishing Junk Drawer, and it's a much more shoot from the hip type of show, right? Wouldn't you say? One might even call it exceedingly rough around the mm. edges, but <laughs> a according to the folks who've heard the first two episodes of it, yeah. that's where its charm lies. I don't think anyone said that. I think that was just Anyway, you. Yeah. while while the exact posting days are still a little sporadic, the bottom line is we are creating a new episode of The Astonishing Junk Drawer every dark week mm. of our main show here. Yeah, which means if you're a patron at the $5 and above level, you can now hear new content from us year round. Yeah, not even my mom is going to want to do that, oh. but some of you folks out there seem to be okay with it. Mm. Go figure. Astonishing Junk Drawer has regular segments from our astonishing producer, head researcher, and social media manager, Tess Feifel. It has reader emails and special guests for short appearances, including, mm -hmm. of course, Richard Haddam. He was on the first one, uh, but others too, like for the first time in the history of Astonishing Legends, my wife, comedy writer Emily Spivey, who had yeah. a freaky paranormal story that in 30 years of being together, I had never heard. Yeah, weird, <laughs> uh, but pretty good stuff, man. Uh, so if you're interested in the Dark Week show, head over to patreon.com slash astonishing legends and sign up. Yes, and on top of that, we're still in the process of posting our entire back catalog to our YouTube channel for listening there. So uh, we're going to have a new show going up from our archives there every other weekday, mm -hmm. pretty much until September. Uh, the order's a little wacky right mm -hmm. now until mm -hmm. April, but after that, it will make more sense. Oh, and, and we're planning more bonus video content for both Patreon and YouTube. So yeah, uh, lots of additional new stuff in all the places. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. And on top of that, Tess wanted us to be sure and mention Astonishing Madness. It's like like March Madness, you heard of that, right? But instead of yeah. basketball, it's a 16-seat bracket of our favorite creatures, cryptids, entities, and astonishing episodes to enter a March Madness-esque battle for the coveted title of Most Astonishing, voted on by you, the listeners. The Astonishing Madness winner will receive a grand prize, including a sweet box from Sugarbot Sweet Shop, a free year of our highest Patreon tier, Skinwalker Squadron, and a $75 digital gift card to the store. Brackets are due March 4th, voting begins March 8th, and continues every Tuesday and Thursday through April 5th on AL's Facebook private group, Twitter, and Instagram stories. To vote, you do not have to submit a bracket. For all the information and directions on how to submit your bracket, head to any of our social pages or our blog at astonishinglegends.com or just ask Tess. Right. So one last thing. We honestly could not believe this ourselves. More and more, we're getting emails from folks reaching out to us that we thought we'd never hear from. And one of those emails we got a few days ago came from someone that we weren't sure was alive or a real person. <laughs> no offense, Ken. Uh, yeah, in fact, we thought his name might be a pseudonym, and we certainly didn't think we'd ever get an email from him, but we got one from Ken Webster. Yes, that Ken Webster, uh, the one that wrote and personally experienced the events depicted in The Vertical Plane. And Ken wrote, Hi, many thanks for the intelligent dialogue on our experience, which was much appreciated. I've shared a link to your podcast, episodes 217 and 218, in the second edition of The Vertical Plane. I hope this is okay. Yes, it is. Quite okay. <laughs> More than okay. Very much okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, this second edition is a significantly cheaper option at under 20 pounds. And he's talking about British sterling. Yes. And was published in an attempt to defeat the speculators, hopefully. That's so cool. And that's, uh, yeah. yeah, well, no. You feel bad about how expensive it was getting. I know. Yeah. People were clamoring for it, though. They wanted to get the, you, you got to read it. You, you got to read it for yourself. We, yes, we couldn't exactly. cover Agreed. everything in it. And it's a great read. Anyway, uh, so this is uh, basically me saying this now. He sent a link to us, which will be in the show notes for listeners. But we made a tiny URL for it, which is tinyurl.com slash vertical plane, P-L-A-N-E. And then the number two, and then the letters A-L. So that's the number two, followed by the letters A-L. And then Ken signed it. Best wishes to you all, Ken. 
Yeah, pretty cool. I, I was very excited about that and even more excited that we're now immortalized in the second edition of that book, mm. uh, which he is sending us some signed copies of. I can't wait for that. Yeah. We, of course, asked him if he'd like to join us on one of our platforms for a little discussion, and he politely passed. Uh, but he did say <laughs> we could send him some written questions, and he yeah. would do his best to answer them. So we're going to do that, and mm-hmm. whenever we hear back from him, we'll share those answers somewhere in the Astonishing Verse. Yeah, still super cool, man, and very exciting stuff. Man, I would love to go just get a pint with that guy, but I guess we're going to have to get across the pond first, you and I, and we will do yes. that one day. We have so many uh, great fans, so many stories over there. We we got to go, but uh, it's yes, gonna, absolutely. It'll, yeah, it'll be a while. Well, all right, folks, it's time to get into tonight's topic, the mysterious and legendary structures at Pumapunku and Tiwanaku in Bolivia. Okay, folks, this is a fun one. It's actually been in the production pipeline for months. It just takes a long time to get these ones off the ground, so you have to be patient with us. But now we are ready to do this. This is something we haven't done in a while. It's an archaeological topic that's mixed with a a mysterious history. There may be paranormal components. There may not. We'll be talking about that. This is a two-part series. Tonight is the first of the two parts on Pumapunku, which is a component of a larger site in Bolivia known as uh, Tiwanaku or Tiwanaku, depending on how you wish to pronounce it. Either way is correct. We'll cover that in a minute. Yes, we'll cover that in a minute. But before we get into it, as with anything like this that's a little more academic in nature, especially in the first part of the series, we do want to talk about our sources and contributors on this one, because that's really, really important. On On the shows like this, where it's more than just a couple of books for source material, or one eyewitness's story, it, it takes a lot to get all the information together. Forrest, you want to start off, I guess, with the with our researchers from the Astonishing Research Corps, right? Yeah, we'd like to thank the members of the ARC and the ARC Green Room. And the ARC members really hit this one out of the park. So we'd like to thank them in no particular order. Anna, Bert, Melissa, Rue, Angela, Lauren, Matt C., Michael M., and Mike K. Plus... Uh, anyone gonna, we left wait, out? Wait, I'm going to a pause there for you to go back and edit that in later. Oh, so we can go back it. and put Oh, some... we forgot to mention so-and-so, yeah. Oh, yeah, we cannot forget. And our apologies to anyone we're missing who contributed to this subject, but your contributions are no less appreciated, honestly. That is the truth, Sincerely, yes. yes. Uh, no, a lot of people had disparate things that they brought to the table, and what was interesting about this subject is that There are different components, as you see. There's a straightforward archaeological theme and bent, I guess, to the subject. There is a possibly paranormal or ancient technology bent or just general mystery, history's mysteries angle to this story. There's different components about maybe new geopolymers that were discovered by ancient peoples and metallurgy that we've lost knowledge about. There's so many fascinating aspects about this subject that that a lot of the ARC members came at it with a, from the angle of the rabbit hole they fell into. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Put that any better. It's just like, you know, people found an angle that they liked and they went with it. So we'll be hearing about some of those things in part two, which will cover more of the, I guess mystery is a good way to put that, and the theories and the hypotheses about how these people were able to accomplish what they did, which still baffles people to this day. So Part one will be a straightforward look at what is this topic about? Now, Scott, I was going to ask you, I've heard the names Pumapunku and Tiwanaku for a long time, saw some really interesting documentaries a handful of years ago that were a head scratcher to me. It's like, what do you mean these blocks are that big? How do they put them together? How do they fit so precisely? What happened to the place? Why did people seem to leave in a hurry? All these things were very interesting to me, of course, but I never dove down very deeply into this subject. So what did you know about it? Or how did you first hear about Pumapunku? Well, it's an interesting story. I first heard about this from a good friend of mine named Forrest Burgess. Mm. And I had not heard of it prior to you bringing it up to me. And I, I feel like I remember the first time you brought it up to me because it's kind of a funny word if you're American. And sure. <laughs> Pumapunku, I was like, what What are you talking about? No, no, this will be great. It's It's really, and I was like, I had not heard of it, and it's odd that I hadn't because it is a significant archaeological mystery. It's right in our wheelhouse. It's uh, reminiscent of Gebekli Tepe, which will come up as we talk about it in other archaeological mysteries about ancient cultures that are really fascinating. It brings a lot of that to mind, and we'll talk about that as we get into it, but I had not heard of it until you brought it up. 
which I think the first time you mentioned it, you know, we should cover this. I think it was a couple years ago. You said something to me about this. It took us this long to get it out the door. So the first time I heard of it was from you. Fair enough. And the reason I remembered it is because at the time, I thought that this subject was as perhaps as big a mystery as the building of the pyramids. And I think it still holds up that people are just as flabbergasted and have a lot of their own theories and possibilities and speculations and hypotheses about how this could have been achieved. But aside from that, there's a really interesting cultural and archaeological and just human history story behind this mystery, you could say. So as we start off here, we're going to be gathering and calling from a lot of different varied sources on this one. Just a few of these to to start us off. Uh, there's a great overview article that Tess found by Amy Lamoureux on allthatsinteresting.com called Pumapunku, The Ancient Ruins Where the Inca Believed the World Began. Yeah, it's a great piece. And that's a, a very broad overview, but it has some interesting tidbits. That's a good one to get your feet wet on. But also we're going to be pulling from some academic journals and, and mostly from their abstracts, as in the Journal of Field Archaeology, Volume 31, number two, and a researcher who I believe started off writing and researching about Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, and that's Alexei Vranich from the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, Philadelphia. So we'll look at a couple of journal articles by him. And for one of my favorite sources here, a lot of the framing is going to be on a very solid foundation. I'm a huge fan of this guy. We've talked about him before, and that is... Dr. Edwin Barnhart, PhD, director of the Maya Exploration Center. And the reason you may have heard of him, certainly for us, is that he has a few terrific lecture series on Wondrium, specifically about South America, but also just from the tourism angle. There's a travel log of sorts series that he does that we've talked about. But here he's talking straight up archaeology about South America. And this series is called The Lost Worlds of South America. Specifically, we're going to be taking a look at lecture number 12, Enigmatic Tiwanaku by Lake Titicaca. You know, this guy's an archaeologist, explorer, professor, and he's been there a lot. He really knows what he's talking about. And when we say in the ads, this is information that we trust, I stand by that 110%. Because as you know, as we've told you, when you come across a lot of different research, you're not sure who's getting their information from where. A great article may just be quoting stuff that's not been well-researched by other people who were also not well-researching the subject. And it just gets passed along, as we've talked about before. But here, it's like this guy is a professor and working archaeologist in exactly what we're going to be talking about. So trust him fully, and also he's very entertaining. So I highly recommend it. It's a great way to get into Wondrium. And if you think this sounds like an ad for Wondrium, don't worry, there will be one of those actually later in the program. Also, I just want to make it clear, we picked this topic long before we realized Wondrium had a course on this or that Dr. Barnhart had any lectures on it. And once we got into it and got it into the production schedule, it just happened to align with a night when uh, they had a commercial in the show anyway. So we we will be tying that together. But it was a great source for us. Um, The information that came from his lecture was well parsed and easy to follow, and he does a great job of presenting it. So there are going to be other sources that we'll be citing as well when we get to them, some uh, mostly just abstracts from some journals that we found entries or that our research found, I should say, with interesting theories about some of the things going on at Pumapunku. But before we get to that, uh, we should start out by explaining what Pumapunku is. In fact, with an abstract or or some quotes from an abstract, this is from a dissertation uh, written in 1999 by the aforementioned Alexei Vranich, or Vranich, I'm not sure how you say his last name, again from the University of Pennsylvania. And this paper was entitled, Interpreting the Meaning of Ritual Spaces, the Temple Complex of Pumapunku, Tiwanaku, Bolivia. The reason that we're borrowing from the, some of these phrases from these abstracts is because it's a really concise and easy to understand explanation of what this site is. The first sentence I'm going to take out of context from that is, quote, one of the largest and most important ritual precincts in the pre-Columbian city of Tiwanaku. Another sentence I would like to take from that is a monumental cluster that is part of Tiwanaku. And yes, granted, there's going to be a few sophomore jokes tonight. And for me, <laughs> monumental and cluster is usually followed by a different word, you know, <laughs> when it applies to my life. Nice. But in this case, it actually means a cluster of monuments, a collection of monuments that is part of Tiwanaku. And specifically, the reason it says it's part of something called Tiwanaku, for those of you that don't know, 
that is a larger area, a settlement. So this is a, a smaller subset of a bigger settlement. You're going to understand it very well by the end of part one tonight. It took us a while. Don't worry. In fact, from my notes, Scott was saying, I, I'm a little confused here. What is part of what? Yeah, it was difficult to get into it first. Right. And here is another quote I want to make. And this is in 2013 in the Journal of Field Archaeology, volume 31, dated uh, 2006, issue number two. The same gentleman, Alexei Vronich, wrote the following field report. This one's called The Construction and Reconstruction of Ritual Space at Tiwanaku, Bolivia, AD 500 to 1000, where he described it again more effectively than we can. And, and this quote really encapsulates it, I think, very well. Quote, the Pumapunku Temple Complex facilitated movement of large throngs of pilgrims. It served both as a ritual gateway to the city and as a theater for projecting a redundant and widely comprehensible message to arriving visitors through the use of facades and intentional alignments of sacred features, end quote. So these things kind of paint a broad stroke picture of this ritualistic area that is a smaller portion of a larger settlement and the mystery about it will unfold as we describe it further. Well, perhaps just as academically qualified, but more plainly spoken comes from the description in lecture number 12 by Dr. Edwin Barnhart. As he describes Pumapunku in his video lecture series, Pumapunku has also been identified by archaeologists as an elite residential complex of man-made plazas and ramps and with a sunken court arranged in a T-shape and constructed on a terrace platform mound with the ruins of a monumental structure sitting on top. And found at the site are massive, precisely cut, interlocking blocks, impressive carved stone gates, impressive monolith statues, and remnants of high art pottery and metalwork. And quoting Amy Lamaru's article, who we mentioned at the top of the show here, the ruins of Pumapunku so impressed the Inca that they believed it was the place where the gods first created the world. So back then, it was very impressive to ancient peoples as well as modern peoples now. Well, Scott, where is it located? Well, firstly, and most basically, Pumapunku is in Bolivia, as we said at the top of the show. The second thing to understand is that it's at the Tiwanaku site in the Tiwanaku Valley, which is just south of Lake Titicaca. Is that it? You're, you're done? Yeah, that's it. That's it. I probably would have oh. made some stupid joke, but I, even when, as I was doing the research online for this show, one of the things that was highlighted was how Americans frequently make sophomoric jokes about Lake Titicaca, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I, oh, so you were pausing for people to make their own jokes. I get it. Yeah, and I'm probably yeah. not saying it right either. It's, it's probably more, I think it's more Titi, Titicaca. I'm not sure. We're going to talk a little bit about this too, is that there's a slight difference between the indigenous languages and the Spanish languages that came to dominate the region, of course, after the Spanish right. came to South America and how some of the names have changed. But there is, of course, indigenous names that are blended, you could say, and yes. pronounced slightly differently today. So, Right, yes. and even uh, Tiwanaku itself is Tiwanaku, and Tiwanaku is the more traditional spelling, or is that the Spanish take on it? Right. Well, Tiwanaku is the original take, I think. Anyway, we'll get to that yeah, in a minute. But I actually made a note of that. But yes, in yeah. the uh, what he's talking about here, Lake Titicaca, it's near that recognizable inward bend on the left side of the continent. And yes. the name Puma Punku means literally the gate of the Puma and the native Aymara and Quechua languages of the Bolivian and Peruvian Andes, respectively. So that's what I was talking about is that, yeah, the Aymara people, they have their own native language, the Quechua language is from the Andean people around that area, and some of those names of their ancient places have been handed down. Now, here's what's interesting is that they don't really know what Tiwanaku people called themselves. Right. Because there was no written language, as far as they know yet, okay? So how are they connected? How is Pumapunku connected to Tiwanaku? Well, the pre-Columbian archaeological site of Tiwanaku, where Pumapunku rests, is about 43 miles or 70 kilometers west of La Paz, the seat of government and the legislative and executive capital of the plural national state of Bolivia. And it was fought uh, for, I think the current president or maybe a past president of Bolivia fought for that because he has indigenous roots and fought to get that part of the name, that description, Plura National State of Bolivia, because there's a lot of indigenous peoples and different nationalities there with a lot of heritage of differing backgrounds. So that is why it's called the Plura National State of Bolivia. 
pronounced in Spanish, Tiwanaku comes out as Tiahuanaco or Tiahuanacu. So that is the Spanish equivalent of Tiwanaku. So just as uh, if you're listening, I know it's hard to tell the difference, especially with my horrible accents here, but uh, Tiwanaku is generally spelled T-I-W-A-N-A-K-U. The other Spanish spellings are, as you would imagine, T-I-A-H-U-A-N-A-C-O. I believe I made the notes correctly here. So essentially, Tiwanaku is the area of monumental structural clusters, of which Pumapunku is one, and around 8 to 10 miles from the famous Lake Titicaca. Right, and it's thought to have peaked with its original population anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 people sometime around 800 CE. That's current era, just for folks. There's so many different ways to do the year. Or common era, yeah. (laughs) Anyway. Tiwanaku, or Tiwanaku, is thought to have peaked with its original population anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people sometime around 800 CE, which is common era or current era. Some archaeologist estimates extend that range to the Tiwanaku society, peaking between 700 and 1,000 current era, and a population as high as 400,000 inhabitants. Right. That's like the size of Syracuse, people, for those of you. (laughs) These are educated guesses. Yeah. So the the time ranges, they could be off by a few thousand years. As you'll see with some folks, they believe it is much, much older. And the population size at its peak can vary widely because they don't really know. These are educated guesses. So you can tell, though, that this was a very large, for the area, society at the time when it reached its height. But it started off as a small village like any other place. So, before we start talking about the rise of Tiwanaku as a major center of the era, of course, all these places, as I just said, start from small beginnings. There are some cultural backdrops which fostered the rise of a place like Tiwanaku. So now we're going to let the discussion be framed by the Wondrium course, again, as we mentioned at the top here, from Dr. Edwin Barnhart, from the Wondrium lecture series, The Lost Worlds of South America, lecture number 12, Enigmatic Tiwanaku by Lake Titicaca. It's a great overview with a lot of interesting factoids, but framed very solidly and in a trustworthy manner. You can trust this information here. So we use that as kind of a skeleton or framing for a lot of the discussion here, making sure that we hit the high points of what is known and not known about Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. So As he describes it, the region of Lake Titicaca and the land surrounding it are referred to collectively as the Altiplanos, or the High Plains. And this area is one of South America's most impressive cultural archaeological sites, and it's where they built their capital there, Tiwanaco. Although you'll hear Professor Barnhart pronounce it uh, in the Spanish variation, Tiahuanaco. So I believe to really understand Tiwanaku, you have to understand the region and and how a place like that could come about and look at the the background and the culture that spawned a place like that, of such a marvel that the Inca referred to Lake Titicaca as their origin place. So this was a special place to the Inca that came much later after the Tiwanaku peoples. And an old abandoned city on the south end of Lake Titicaca fits perfectly into the pre-origin mythology Pretty closely. Its uniquely sophisticated architecture and huge sculptures have inspired claims of great antiquity, advanced technology beyond their date, and, of course, even theories of alien contact. So, yeah. <laughs> as Professor Barnhart goes on to describe, Lake Titicaca is a, it's an ecological marvel. And uh, sadly, these days, there's a lot of pollution, it's been overfished. There's actually not a lot of people fishing it these days. Oh, yeah. Trout were introduced, I think, in the 30s, and that just destroyed the population of uh, indigenous fish, native fish. Then people started eating the trout, and then the trout population declined. So it's sadly in not such a great state these days. You know, I've never really been a dieter because while I do have some discipline in certain aspects of Uh, my life, sticking to a diet is not really one of them. I know. But I have to say, new weight has worked for me in ways that I couldn't have imagined because it's not a diet. It's very much a these are not the snacks you're looking for kind of situation. (laughs) Right. And, And I don't mean that it's restricted because it's not. What I mean is that it's helping me control my own mind through psychology. It's teaching me skills that are helping me to be a lot smarter about not just trying to solve the 
pang of hunger, Mm -hmm. but how to think specifically about what I'm eating and what quantity each day. And the habits I'm building with it are healthier than any I've ever had. And on top of that, they're easy to sustain. Yeah, man, that's a great point. You know, Noom doesn't believe in restricting what you can or can't eat. The goal is rather to teach you how to make informed choices that suit your lifestyle, but also help you reach any goals that you've set. Yeah, Noom Weight works by taking advantage of cognitive behavioral therapy. That's the Jedi mind stuff. And, yeah. and that's why you're able to manage it so well, because it's teaching you about your personal relationship with food and why you eat the way you do. Noom understands that weight loss can be difficult and that you can have a lot of ups and downs while you're on that path. They embrace that by focusing on progress, not perfection. Look, everyone's journey is different, but Noom is right there with you all along the way. And on top of that, it only takes like 5, 10, or 15 minutes a day. It's your choice on how much time you want to spend on the app each day. The facts are more than 75% of users at Noom complete the program, and more than 60% of users lose 5% or more body weight by 16 weeks. And also more than 60% of the users engaged with the program keep the weight off for a year or more. On top of that, they've published more than 30 peer-reviewed scientific articles that inform users, practitioners, scientists, and the public about how their methods work and how effective they are. Sign up for your trial and get psychology-based support and motivation to reach your goals at noom.com slash astonishing. That's n-o-o-m dot com slash astonishing to sign up for your trial. Like we said at the top of the show, we've had an unusual but frankly not surprising confluence of events on the show this week because some of the best information we found on Pumapunku came to us from a Wondrium course. Mm -hmm. This course was called The Lost Worlds of South America, and it's taught by Dr. Edwin Barnhart, PhD, director of the Maya Exploration Center. Yeah, man, this is a great series, and uh, we've bumped into him before. Uh, Always terrific. You trust it. There are 24 lectures in this series, and they cover pretty much every South American civilization you've ever heard of, including Tiwanaku and the Lake Titicaca Basin. Yeah, a lot of the information in tonight's episode came from Lecture 12 in this series, but the whole series is amazing. And if you watch the whole series, which is easy because it's totally bingeable, the depth of your understanding of the history of the entire continent of South America will be far beyond most folks that you know. If you're into tonight's topic and you want to learn more about not only Puma Punku, but dozens of other sites in South America, we highly recommend checking out The Lost Worlds of South America, which is only available to stream on Wondrium. Wondrium is home to video and audio learning experiences on virtually any topic you can imagine. They have documentaries, series, lessons, how-tos, and more. And all of it's presented by teachers, professors, and experts like Dr. Barnhart, who not only really know their stuff, but make learning fun and exciting. On top of that, the Wondrium app is super versatile. You can watch the lectures or listen to them as audio only across multiple platforms, picking up where you left off, and, and making it easy to learn while you're on the go. And as I said earlier, in the show tonight about not just Dr. Barnhart, but all of the content creators they have. You know you can trust the accuracy of the information. Wondrium is offering our listeners a special limited time offer, a free 22-day trial membership. To get this offer, you need to visit wondrium.com slash legends. Again, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash legends. Sign up today. Hi, I'm Chris Campo, and when I'm not playing the banjo or checking for werewolves in my kid's closet, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. And now, back to the show. So this lake is at a very high elevation. It's 12,500 feet above sea level. It spans the Peru and Bolivian borders, and it is considered the highest navigable lake in the world. Although there are lakes that are higher that you can have small boats on, this means (laughs) like you can have a commercial vessel on it. Right, right. Sail around on it. From north to south, it's about 118 miles or 190 kilometers long, and it's 931 feet or 284 meters at its deepest point. Yeah. There's the big northern part of the lake called the Grande section, and then the smaller Pequeño portion in the south. And when you see it on Google Earth, you take a look at it uh, at our website for this episode, you can clearly see the larger and smaller portions. And what's interesting is, and you'll hear this as the story unfolds, is that the water levels may have been fluctuating wildly for Mm -hmm. hundreds of years, but they're not quite sure. That's the other thing that's strange about that. 
Another thing that's interesting about this is that Thor Heyerdahl came to the area, right? <laughs> well, yeah, there's been a couple famous visitors, of course, uh, a lot of people involved in nature and ecology to study the region and also for cultural reasons. As we said, it's, it's a touchstone of sorts, or I, I'm not sure what the proper word is, but it is a major feature of South American civilization and quite a place of interest. There's a lot of great ruins around there. And... In 1973, Jacques Cousteau visited, and he was hoping, uh, I think, of course, to dive on some Inca ruins. Yes. Didn't really find any ruins in the, the, the weeks and months that he spent there, but he did find a new species of a uh, huge toad. Or yeah, huge 20 frog. pounds, these Up things. to 20 pounds. Yeah, these giant frogs. Yeah. And I think one of their specialties is that they can stay underwater for a very long time, absorbing oxygen through their skin. Yeah. So they don't come up very often. But right. yeah, so he discovered a new species of frog. That was very exciting. As sadly as uh, Dr. Barnhart says is that the locals would say like, yeah, we used to see these a lot and now we don't really see a whole lot of them. So wildlife is a bit on the decline in the area. But on another note, another famous visitor, Thor Heyerdahl, and people might remember hearing his name because he proved that you could take a small boat and sail it from South America to Oceania. And that's exactly what he did on a vessel he named the Contiki. So basically the story goes, and this is also what's interesting. He went to the coast of South America and he thought what he wanted to do was, is get a natural native traditional boat made and see if he could sail it all the way to Oceania. And no one on the coast he found could make the boat. He had to go to Lake Titicaca, which is inland a bit. That's right. Those people on the lake, they knew how to make that boat, which they call a balsa. Now, I thought it was balsa wood, but I, that's just probably me being ignorant. But the balsa-type boat, and it's not too small. It's 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 fairly good size. But he took that, had it built at Titicaca, and then moved it to the coast and then sailed off. And he proved that early man could have reached the Americas by sea. Didn't necessarily have to be the land bridge. Yeah. And for folks that don't know, Oceania is a collection of islands. Uh, it includes Australasia, Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia. Yeah. When you look at it on a map, you're like, oh, that's not that big. But it has a land area of almost 3.3 million square miles and a population of over 41 million now. So he was just trying to show that you could get from the western coast of South America over to this set of islands. And it changes the way that we think about how humans migrated. And right. yeah, it's fascinating. He had to go there where the technology was to get the boat built. That's a good point because... Some of the artisanship remains to this day. A lot of it's been lost. That's a big theme here in that there are people who can still make and build amazing things, but the the bigger, more mysterious stuff, that's totally been lost. And they're not sure that never got passed down. So nobody's sure how they accomplished it. But here's a little uh, factoid about the name of the boat. Thor Heyerdahl named it the Contiki Viracocha because the people around the lake still recognized a single creator deity named Contiki Viracocha. And Viracocha is a Quechua or Inca name or word. So he honored them with the naming of the boat after their creator god for the, uh, the deities that are believed to have been around the lake. As the Inca said, that was their birthplace. Whereas the Tiwanaku people, I believe, and I'll have to look at our notes as we progress along here, they believe they came from the rocks, that they were autochthonous. I learned that from yeah. another wondering, of course, about the mysterious Etruscans. So many yes. people are mysterious back in the old days. We just don't know a lot about them, but a lot of our traditions today come from their secret ways. So that's also uh, Yeah, whenever I think about rock people, I always think about the <laughs> first version of Star Trek and they, they go on that planet and there's that one dude who's made out of rocks. It right, like, scared me right. to death when I was a kid. Yeah. But he had like the red eyes. Yeah. When he got done talking, he would just sit down and become a pile of rocks. That's right. Well, one of my favorite characters was The Thing from yes. the Fantastic Four because he was made out of rocks. And I had yeah, a lot of questions right. about that's how right. he did things, let's say. Well, here's another interesting item about the the culture and the the birth of it. And what do archaeologists and anthropologists think about this culture? Well, around 800 BCE, they believe people started to settle in larger communities around the lake. Back then, of course, huge lake makes life a lot easier when you got food right there, water, fresh water. And so it's a big attractor for a early human settlement. Well, about 200 BCE, there was a shared pattern in the religion. 
of the cultures that developed around the lake. Similar architecture, the ceramics were similar, putting up of stone monoliths standing in their ceremonial centers was similar and shared by these cultures. And as you go along here, what I'm going to point out is that, you know what, I'm going to say this for a minute because there's a whole discussion that we're going to talk about, about Tiwanaku having been influenced and then influencing other cultures in the area. So yes. the term though for this culture around the lake became Yaya Mama or Father Mother. Now this is, I found this fascinating. The name was given to them because it's based on some of the monuments that are standing at these sites because there seemed to be quite often a female figure on one side and a male figure on the other or the concept of male-female relational opposites yin and yang, night and day. That's how the, the binary world works. And so that became the name of this type of culture, the Yaya Mama culture. So the culture was named for those sculptures, essentially. And the Yaya Mama culture developed on the north end of the lake. Now, when you take a look at this on the map, and I invite you to do so, uh, Scott's found some uh, anana from the Ark that really dove into the Google Earth aspect. Yeah, that is a rabbit hole. You could get lost for hours and just checking things out. Yes. And to be fair, I found it in our research group. It was really the research group that found these images. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But Scott, I only had to I click on one app. Yeah. And it was right there. So right. thanks to them. Well, it's, it's a very large lake and it may have been altered by ancient peoples using this advanced technology. That's pretty interesting. Well, we're going to explore that later on. But the settlements around the lake developed their culture into this Yaya Mama style. And a large site called Pukara became one of the biggest centers around the lake. There's an actually a, an explanation here, which is pretty simple. Scott, you want to dive into that? Because it's a significant archaeological site on the north end of Lake Titicaca on the Peruvian side. So here's a description of Pucara from uh, Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. It is a defensive hilltop site or fortification built by the pre-Hispanic and historic inhabitants of the central Andean area. Yeah. That's from Ecuador to central Chile and northwestern Argentina. In some cases, these sites acted as temporary fortified refuges during periods of increased conflict, while other sites show evidence for permanent occupation. Emerging as a major site type during the late intermediate period, circa 1000 to 1430 AD, the Pucara form was adopted in some areas by the Inca military and contested borderlands of the Inca Empire. The Spanish also referred to the Mapuche earthen forts built during the Arauco War in the 16th and 17th centuries by this term. So wow, uh, that, that gives you a little bit of information about the Pucara region. But archaeologists from this area are careful to assert that the Pucara area has nothing to do with cultural developments taking place in the north. There's another area called Chavan, and it was developing around the same time, yeah. around 800 to 200 BCE, before Common right. Era, or before Common Era. But Professor Barnhart actually wonders if there is a connection, even though there's archaeologists that are saying there isn't. And uh, Forrest makes a good point here in our notes. It's just like, <laughs> these guys don't all agree about this. No. Archaeologists in particular have lots of varying philosophies. Right. And here's my little anecdote I like to tell every time we have a an archaeological topic. Yeah. Good friend of mine, a longtime friend who's also interested in these types of topics. His wife at the time was about to deliver her doctoral thesis in South American archaeology. And I was like, well, right. that, that's fascinating. I mean, this is years and years ago. And I said, uh, wow, that is that blows my mind. I, I love it. It's so interesting. How is it coming? She's, well, I'm, I'm pretty worried. And I said, well, wh oh, you don't have enough done or you got more to write? She goes, and it's not that. She says, once you submit your paper and it gets known to the peer-reviewed groups, that immediately puts you in a camp of, no, no, we are these types of academics who believe this. You're on that other camp. You have to go live with them who don't believe the same things we do. And you guys are wrong. And so, that's what I'm saying. It's just very contentious. That, yeah. And this is why some people, a small portion of our listeners, get so angry with us. Because in every episode, we move to a different camp. <laughs> that's just what we do. Because <laughs> right. we're, we're checking well, it out. We like to hey, visit. We just can only go with things that make sense to us. And uh, yeah. we don't have a lot of sense to begin with. But my point <laughs> here is that, yeah, it, they disagree a lot about the origins and meanings of certain things that are found what the findings mean, and also the, the anthropological aspect and importance of it is it varies depending on where you are from, actually. And here we'll see some of the regional archaeologists don't agree with the archaeologists from other cultures who come in to study this group. 
Yes, and that comes up over and over and has been coming up for a hundred years when it comes to archaeology and this particular site and all sites, really, when you take a look at it. And it's it's something that I wasn't super aware of until we started reading about this because I hadn't paid a lot of attention to yeah. something like that in this case other than Gebekli Tepe, which we didn't really find a ton of conflict there in assessments, probably because it's so much older than this site. It's right. seven or 8,000 years thought to be, or maybe even more, older than Pumapunku and Tiwanaku. But what's fascinating about this site to me and these folks is, and Professor Barnhart says this in the Wondrium course, is that the other thing that archaeologists do when they come in is they want to say that they found something different. So when they discover a culture that is derivative of another culture or that there seem to be connections to, they may have... These are my words, not Professor Barnhart's words or anybody else's words. Mm -hmm. I'm coming back to something that we talked about way back in episodes three and four of Astonishing Legends when we were talking about Amelia Earhart, and that's confirmation bias. And so these archaeologists come in, and they may have a confirmation bias when they come across a site to be like, I've discovered something completely new and entirely unrelated Mm -hmm. to that thing 600 miles from here that seems to be like it might be a little related. But it's not. It's not related. (laughs) This one is different, and my name shall be on all the papers. You know, there's that kind (laughs) of thing happening. And he it's fascinating. He talks a little bit about that. But the other yeah. thing that you find when you start to look at how these folks were researching this particular site over the years is everything was seen through their filters. Like you said, they're coming from other yeah. cultures and they're bringing their own cultural experience to it. And then beyond that, there's also the difference in evaluating something on this purely scientific level, which of course has its value, but it may be it's not so healthy to completely discard the deeper and more spiritual aspects of the local cultures and how those yeah. things can enhance your understanding of what you are excavating or, right. or looking into. See, now that reminds me of Gobekli Tepe and our learning about processional archaeology and the new quote unquote yes. archaeology and how you, you know, the newfangled, maybe a little bit woo angle is that you try to imagine and incorporate into your analysis and assessments how the people then felt about the things you're studying nowadays and, and which are unearthing and, and what did it mean to them? And you try and soak in the, the vibe and the feeling of the place as a legitimate aspect of the research. And of course, old fashioned people say, no, 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 let's just clear out the dirt. I don't care about your fancy this and that or what meant what to whom. Let's just get to the full pots. And, and that includes even broken shards of pottery which were tossed out. And it's people like Kathleen Kenyon who started to examine shards when only full pots were examined. So it's changed a lot and the the philosophies have changed a little bit. But yes, just my, my point here before I let you continue is that Dr. Barnhart does hint at saying the regional archaeologists would like to think that Tiwanaku is a pretty unique spot. Not really connected. We don't really, you know, they're very conservative in their estimates about how this might be connected to other archaeological sites in the region. And uh, yeah, even uh, ones that are 600, let's say Chauvin, which we're going to talk about here in a second, 770 miles approximately to the north or 1,239 kilometers. So they would like to say that what we've discovered essentially is No, this is a special, unique place. And it is, I believe. He's just saying like, well, maybe there are some connections we're overlooking. We're we're giving them short shrift and that maybe there's some other things that are rhyming here that we should take a look at and pay attention to. So we're going to, we're going to explore that in a second here. Right. But to be clear, and we'll talk about Chavan here in a second, I'm going to let you read those entries because they're filled with accents that I'm going to mess up. (laughs) The reason that we're focusing on Pumapunku and the world does in terms of mystery is because even if there were sites that predate it that have some common themes and connections between their architecture or the artwork or the other things that uh, you might find across the different sites, there is a component of Pumapunku specifically the subset of Tiwanaku, Pumapunku itself, that architecturally and from a construction standpoint is truly on its own. There is nothing like it anywhere in the world. And on top of that, it's unparalleled in terms of whatever the complex way is that it was constructed. And and that's what we're going to be getting into tonight. Yeah, a little little hint. These blocks, some of them are massive. We're going to talk about how massive they are, but they're so massive, so precisely masoned, (laughs) formed, cut, however you think they did it, into Lego-like shapes. As you, you might see some photos, they look like giant H's that have beveled edges and interlocking blocks. And 
people cannot imagine how this was accomplished because there's no evidence of any of the tools they use. So like the pyramids, it's like, well, a, a system of levees and, and channels and uh, canals, perhaps, reed boats, ice tracks. There's all kinds of theories that, that sprout up from this, but it's still an architectural marvel. And a lot of it is still there. That's the other thing is that you can you can see it and kind of get a hint that something big went on in the day. So, but that's not the only place. Like I said, there's a connection perhaps that is made to another site called Chavindi Huantar, and it's C H A V I with an accent. Well, it sounds French to me, Chavin Chavon. Chavon <laughs> de Huantar. Yeah. It's, yeah. It does. But yeah. it's a Chavin, Chavin, Chavin de, de Huantar. And it's the site of some temple ruins in West Central Peru. And the ruins belong to the Chavin the pre-Columbian culture, which flourished around 900 to around 200 BCE, or BC, if you're old-fashioned. And the central building is a massive temple complex constructed of rectangular stone blocks. It contains interior galleries and incorporates bas-relief carvings on pillars and lintels. And that was just the description from, from Encyclopedia Britannica, because it's nice and concise, and I love encyclopedias. Yes. Here are some more descriptions, though, and I'm going to get to something interesting that maybe ties this and what Pumapunku meant to the people, and also Gobekli Tepe. That's going to happen a little bit here and there. Now, this comes from the sources of Richard L. Berger, Chavin de Huantar, and its sphere of influence in the Handbook of South American Archaeology, also by Sylvia Rodriguez Kemble and John W. Rick, Building Authority at Chavin de Huantar, Models of Social Organization and Development in the Initial Period and Early Horizon. And that's in a book on Andean archaeology. And basically, that kind of sums up the, the wiki introduction to what Chavin is. And so, Chavin de Huantar is just an archaeological site in Peru, and it contains ruins and artifacts. And they think that it was started as early as 1200 BCE and occupied until at least around four to 500 BCE by a major pre-Incan culture called the Chavin. The site is located in the Ancash region, and it is north of the city of Lima, which uh, many of us have heard of. Here's what's interesting, though. The, the people, the occupation of persons at Chavan de Huantar have been carbon dated to around at least 3000 BC. So we're getting pretty ancient here. And the description in the entry goes on to describe it as a ceremonial center activity occurring primarily toward the end of the second millennium and through the middle of the first millennium BC. So human activity and occupation at Chavin de Huantar has been carbon dated to at least around 3000 BCE, with a lot of the ceremonial center activity occurring towards the end of the second millennium. So for millennia, this place has been a major center of religious and spiritual celebration, social gatherings, this and that. And while the fairly large population was based on agricultural economy, the city's location are at the headwaters of the Marignon River. And so this place was a major port as goes on to say, the archaeological site is a large ceremonial center that has revealed a great deal about the Chavin culture. Chavin de Huantar served as a gathering place for people of the region to come together and worship. The transformation of the center into a valley-dominating monument made it a pan-regional place of importance. People went to Chavin de Huantar as a center to attend and participate in rituals, consult an oracle, or enter a cult. And that's going to sound a lot like what we're going to learn about at Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, I think. So already, like I said, to recap what we said before, there's some archaeologists that are not going to agree that there's any real connection between places like Chavin and Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, but we're going to make a point in where we kind of agree with Professor Bardhart in that, yeah, there's some similarities there which make it interesting in that it, it could have birthed a place like Tiwanaku. So Dr. Barnhart, in his Wondrium course, The Lost Worlds of South America, talks about how archaeologist Servio Chavez uh, describes the Yaya Mama culture and some of the common mm -hmm. elements that make it up. One of the things that you see with Yaya Mama sites are rectangular sunken courts, much like Mary Tyler Moore's living room. No, wait, that wasn't. <laughs> well, no, it was a sunken living room. It wasn't rectangular. See, I got a <laughs> laugh out of you there. I right. almost got a spit a, a major building feature that's very distinctive. And it had meaning to these people, 
But just to be clear here, yes. these are four things that archaeologist Sergio Chavez says are very specific and maybe primarily specific with the Yaya Mama culture. Right. And these sites, like, yeah, point one, there's always a sunken court. Well, Shavin de Huantar in the new temple has a rectangular sunken court. Right. And the Yaya Mama courts are going to be surrounded by buildings that are set together and they form a U shape so that there is an open face and then around the other three sides there are buildings. But this is also found at Chavin de Huantar. And they probably took that from other older sites all along the Peruvian coast. So again, this is what Professor Barnard is saying is that, okay, that, that seems to be a big connection between what's found at Tiwanaku and other places like Chavin, which are seem to be much, much older. So there's a theme going on here. That's what he's trying to do. He's, he's going point by point with archaeologist Servio Chavez's four rules for something being a Lake Titicaca, Yaya, Mama type of culture. Yes. And the other points that he goes over are stone monoliths that are standing in the city centers, mm -hmm. which are distinguished from other cultures. They, but there are stone monoliths at Chauvin. Right. And there's some famous ones, in fact. And then he also talks about ritual paraphernalia found yep. at Yaya Mama sites, a, a statuette or a figure with a severed head mm -hmm. and an axe. There's a lot of severed heads going on, by the way. <laughs> there there uh, is. Get ready for that. Yeah. <laughs> Get ready for that. Feline images and pottery, smash pots and food in these offerings right. and in these chambers, which also have severed heads and dismembered bodies in the chambers. Right. right. He talks about the iconography. That's point number four. It's different with the Yaya Mama culture. There's some distinctive styles like lightning bolt symbols, etc. And those symbols you don't necessarily see at Pumapunku, but right. I think Dr. Barnhart is saying, ah, I don't know if this is, there's enough differentiation here to suggest that these things are completely unrelated, right? Yeah, so what you'll notice here is that sometimes it's up for interpretation, as we'll talk about the, the, the sun gate. Some things can look like rays of light to people, and if you look at it closely, it's like, no, no, those look like snakes. I think so they're there's snakes. Some, yeah, there's some, Pumapunku, uh, anyway. yeah, there's some stylistic light motifs that keep coming up between these people that are supposed to be disparate, but really it seems like they share a lot more than some people are willing to consider. So you're getting involved here with semantics and interpretations. And it's, it's kind of like when we had Micah Hanks on last year and he was talking about the search for man like monsters in history and yeah. how maybe Bigfoot had been around longer than we thought it had. It was just all these cultures were using different names and just des and describing it just a little bit differently, not realizing sure. that maybe this was all the same thing. Right. So what Scott is saying here in point four, just to clarify with the last point, is Dr. Chavez is going to say, look, these are four traits that are only really seen with the Yaya Mama cultures, but they're seen other places. You might get a feeling that we're trying to head towards a maybe an idea of simultaneous discovery or some kind of spiritual link, perhaps, uh, seeding these ideas or just travel over long distances to spread these ideas over millennia. That's fascinating to me anyway. So yeah, so what he's saying is that there are some things that you shouldn't see in artwork other places, but you're also going to see things like jaguars featured greatly severed heads, as he said, snakes emerging from headbands and waistbands. And you'll see some of that. So what Dr. Barnhart is hinting at is that as an archaeologist from an inside perspective here, what you want with your site is it to be unique and special, of course. You don't want it to be just, it's another variation, as Scott said earlier, of something already found. So you're going to try and preserve that. But the Amazonian-inspired religion and the oracle pilgrimage pattern, as indicated by these offerings found in, in various rooms here, uh, he goes on to say it's hard to deny that there is some kind of connection to what's going on in the north, inspired by Chavin. So he's saying these things line up a lot, that there is a connection here between these people and these other peoples that are supposedly much earlier. So that brings us to the point now of the beginning of Tiwanaku. As uh, Dr. Barnhart would say, is that it, it's part of a greater lake area, the Yaya Mama tradition, but he will continue to draw parallels to Chavin culture. So now we're shifting down south here to below south of the lake. Now he doesn't believe that the Yaya Mama tradition is something that everyone around the lake shared, but he thinks that the Yaya Mama tradition is also influential and part of what happened at Chavin. So it, it spread that far up. And also I have a lot of, uh, I, I'm trying my hardest not to say yo mama. 
I, I know I was, yeah, the yo, ya, 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 mama jokes. Here I know. Come. No, but what I was going to say is, think about where you're from, wherever you're listening to yeah. our show. It's an, always an amazing thing to me that our show is consumed globally. I find that very exciting. Right. Our voices have traveled much more than I've actually traveled in reality. But <laughs> one of the things that's interesting to me about this is when you look at your, wherever you live, your local community or wherever you were born, or you, you know, mm-hmm. when you look at the larger regions that there are things that are shared culturally. In the United States, you know, right now I'm in the South. I've lived in the South. I've lived in the North, as they say, up with the Yankees, down in the South. I've lived out West with the bleeding heart liberals in California. I've lived everywhere. (laughs) But what you do see in all these different regions, and I'm just talking about within the United States in my case, you see common things and you see things that aren't common. And you see every area has its own thing. So there's no reason not to believe that these cultures back then, there was some common ground, but there were some things that were different or reinterpreted. That's the way human culture works. And right, there's no reason right. to believe that it's any different back then just because it was a long time ago. Exactly. I mean, at least uh, people are people. So, <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're seated by ancient aliens. Which, oh, no, uh, don't. We're done. What? Uh, oh, I, just, I wanted to trigger people early just to kind of <laughs> warm them up to that and uh, get the blood going in case they're starting to nod off. Right, right. Hopefully that will, will pep them up. Hey, you heard my uh, dad ended up in the ER last year, right? You know what? I don't think you told me that. I hope it wasn't too serious. No, thank goodness. He was just dehydrated. Oh, well, you know, just being dehydrated can lead to some serious health problems or yeah. even just feeling achy, you get headache, foggy headed, run down, and, and you don't even realize why it's happening. Yeah, well, he did fall and it scared mm-hmm. mom and me pretty good. Uh, but thankfully, there's a simple remedy for that which is to stay hydrated, <laughs> like everything else living on the planet needs to be. Yeah, all right. So how are you going to get him and everyone else in your family, including you, to yeah, drink more yeah. water? Well, that's the $64 question, you know. He's, he's not one of those sipping water from a sports bottle all day kind of people. <laughs> I, I mean, I get it. Water tastes like water. But he shouldn't be drinking soda or juice all day either. He, so I just shipped them my secret weapon to get more good fluids into them, liquid IV. Folks aren't going to drink something that doesn't taste good, even if it's good for them. It it can't taste like yard trimmings or mud, okay? And that's what Liquid IV has figured out, how to make effective, efficient hydration taste good. Just listen to all the flavors they have. Oh, no, oh, no. Is this going to be one of your lists? You're not going to do a list again, are you? (laughs) Oh, you know it. Uh, Look, you got your classic flavors like lemon lime, strawberry, tangerine, watermelon. But then Liquid IV gets a little more exotic with flavors like pina colada, golden cherry, guava, passion fruit, and even a limited edition caramel apple. And you forget that with Liquid IV, you're also getting five essential vitamins and three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. They're also made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, and free Mm -hmm. of gluten, dairy, and soy. And I like the concept of their cellular transport technology, which enhances rapid absorption of water and other key ingredients faster and more efficiently than water alone. Yep, love all that. And it's available in bulk at Costco, because for my phone, Folks, and me too, frankly, anything from Costco has got to be solid. So it's another selling point. That's right. You can grab Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code LEGENDS at checkout. Yeah, personally, I'd go for the promo because that's 25% off anything you order when you use promo code LEGENDS at liquidiv.com. Experience better hydration today at liquidiv.com, promo code LEGENDS. I just talked about shipping a package, right? Yeah, what about it? Well, what I didn't mention, because it was a different spot, is that I did it with the easiest, cheapest, and most efficient way from home with stamps.com. Well, of course. I mean, I bet most people who haven't tried it think it takes a lot of setup or time to figure out or that you need special equipment, but you really don't. Stamps.com lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process. So you can spend less time at the post office and mm-hmm. more time making your customers happy, or in this case, your parents. <laughs> well, yeah, it was super simple. And Stamps.com made me happy uh, because, yeah, all you need is a computer and a standard printer, no special supplies or equipment. And within minutes, you're up and running, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send it. But here's the part I really enjoyed. I was able to compare prices and services right on my laptop and decide if USPS or UPS would be cheaper or faster. You can get discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off 
UPS. And then you just schedule a pickup and skip that time-wasting trip. Boy, I tell you what, that part, along with the pricing, is especially yeah. important if you're running a small business. Because to you, your business isn't small. It's everything. And getting your products to your customers, uh, your marketing to potential customers, or your paperwork to authorities is critical. That unnecessary trip to the post office or a shipper isn't. Yeah, Stamps.com saves you time, money, and stress. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. They're not going away, and you don't have to go away from your business. So you can keep your focus, your time, your money where it should be. Stop overpaying for shipping with Stamps.com. Sign up with promo code ASTONISHING for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code ASTONISHING. I'm Troy Kindle, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Why don't we start talking about the mystery of Tiwanaku and start describing, if you would, Scott, how it was essentially first discovered by Western Europeans. Right. The first time it was actually mentioned uh, in European written history was by Spanish conquistador Pedro Cieza de Leon in 1549 when he was in the area looking for the Inca capital city of Cuyasuyu. If I'm saying that right, and I might not That's be. Probably uh, pretty close, yeah. Yes, send your emails to Forrest. <laughs> but here's what's interesting about this, and this is one of the things, that, one of the first questions I asked Forrest when I was like looking yeah. at his notes, because he started on this before I got to it. I was like, wait a minute. So these names, they don't mean anything to the people that live there. All these names that we're talking about, the monuments, the different areas, that came later for the most part. That was what it got labeled by folks who came across this stuff later. We don't know what the folks that lived there called it right. because there aren't any written records that have come up and no evidence of a written language. That we know of yet. Yeah, yeah, that we know of yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's Tiwanaku to us. It's these different areas. It's the Pumapunku. That mm -hmm. was what the conquistador named it when he got there looking for something else because we, what are we going to call that? Stack of blocks? Right. No, we need to come up with a name for it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Bernabe Cobo was a Jesuit who actually chronicled the history of Peru, and he wrote that the surrounding area of Tiwanaku was once called Taipicala, which is an Aymara yeah. word, those local indigenous people, meaning stone in the center, suggesting that it was once believed that Tiwanaku was the center of the world. Isn't that fascinating? They also, uh, the, the Inca after them, everybody's thinking like, man, this place is special. It's yeah. the center of the world or center in the stone, which is, you could say, stands for the earth. Taipicala, the Amara indigenous people's word, is what carries on today. So as you were saying, we don't really know what the Tiwanaku people called themselves or how they referred to themselves because we have yet to find any type of written record of their, their daily lives. Now, we do have monuments that are carved with various, uh, as we just said, iconography and images, and we're left to interpret those. But you don't really say, uh, oh, by the way, you know, signed the Tiwanaku people. Yeah. And we actually don't call ourselves that. We call ourselves blank. So right, <laughs> there, right. there's, no, there's no indication. But yeah, you're right. You have to call them something. But this is interesting to me. When the Spanish got there, Bernabe Cobo, he also noted that there was still one gateway and what he called one window standing on one of the platforms when the Spanish arrived at Pumapunku. So some of it, uh, well, that'd be the 1500s, but some of it was still standing. If you look at pictures, there are some windows, which uh, again, I think that the experiencer of the place was meant to look through because uh, it's like one of those little advent calendars or something. You, you, you pull open a shade and something special is behind it or it lines up with some special site. So that's just right. my theory. But yeah, so when he arrived there, you know, back in the, the mid 1500s, that's what they saw. It wasn't as crumbled and weathered and looted and ruined as, as, as it is today. And also, this is an important article. When I mentioned that they might not have had a written language, this is something that one of our researchers found in the Astonishing Research Corps in the green room there. Anna, thanks for stumbling across this and posting it in there. It's from the News Network Archaeology. It's an article called, Writing is not present in all complex, in quotes, societies, but it can signal inequality. And I just want to read the first couple of sentences of this article. This was published on February 10th, 2022. There's not an author's name listed on this. It just says, source. Field Museum, February 10th, 2022. 
For more than a century, written language was seen by anthropologists and other social scientists as a definitional feature of societal complexity, or, in quotes, advancement, a term that is tinged with colonialism and racism. But in a new study in the Journal of Social Computing, researchers found that societies don't need written languages to be large or have complex governments. In a systematic comparative survey of pre-colonial Mesoamerican societies, the study's authors found that some large population centers had written systems of communication, but others did not. At the same time, the centers that had more elaborate computational and writing systems tended to be more autocratic, top-down, ruler-dominated governance than the ones without which is Hmm. fascinating. So we're going to have a link to this article if you want to read more about this idea because it is important. Right. But one of the things that's fascinating about it to me is when you think about, oh, you don't have a written system, that's all I know. That's all a lot of us know because of the time and era that we live in. So you think, how would would information be imparted? Especially when you're looking at a, a complex construction like what we're coming up with here, which there's a suggestion of lost, sophisticated lost technology. And when I think about that technology being lost, my question is, when they were making use of it, how were they conveying it to each other? How right. are they saying, okay, well, this is, if we want to build this, we need to do it this way. It's fascinating to me to think about ways besides writing to get that done. Yeah. yeah. There's some way they did it because that's what I like about this story is we have the proof. They did right. it. Whatever happened or how they figured it out, some of that still remains. And it's quite impressive and mind-blowing in a way. So... So again, just giving another overview of Tiwanaku, which is the larger area that Pumapunku is within, and we're we're focusing mostly on Pumapunku, but you can't talk about Pumapunku without talking about Tiwanaku. So what you should understand when you talk about this part of Bolivia is that it Mm -hmm. is one of the largest archaeological sites in South America. It has a little bit over one and a half square miles of artifacts that have been found near the surface, massive megalithic blocks, artisan ceramics, and again, as we've been saying, structural monuments. And we talked a little bit about the population of it. They think at one point it had 40,000 people in the city. It may have gone up to as many as half a million people in the overall valley, the larger metropolitan Tiwanaku area. (laughs) I mean, that's a lot of folks. And that growth was possible through something that I learned from Dr. Barnhart in the Wondrium course. I mean, we've been studying the idea of mounds and ditches and agriculture for a while, especially since uh, Gobekli Tepe. But just along the way, mounds are obviously a huge thing in archaeology and in the mysterious past of humanity all over the world. This was really interesting to me to hear Dr. Barnhart talk about how the mounds worked as a system, because what they what right. he explains is that they would dig these ditches out, take that earth, put it up onto a mound, and the yeah. soil on the mound would gather heat in the daytime, because at this high altitude, it can get pretty cold at night. And one of the things that they would do is they would plant their agriculture onto the mounds and the mounds would retain that heat that they gathered in the day over the night and protect the plants from the cold weather. And then in addition to this, the ditches next to the mounds were so deep that there were fish living in the ditches in the water there. And when the fishes would do their fish stuff, and then when they died, they would create fertile earth down in the bottom of the ma- of the ditches. So then now they can go in and dig that up and throw it back onto the mound. And it's like a system that sustains itself, allows them to grow food. It's fascinating. Yeah. I always think about something I heard from a home inspector a long time ago when my wife and I were looking at a house that we wanted to buy. One of the things that he said to remember about your home, any home, and he was a very serious inspector. This guy is one of those guys that right. we pay him to check it out before you make an offer on it or whatever, if you're going to be doing that. And you get this really thick book about the whole place. And he said, listen to me. He's like, never forget this. A house <laughs> is a system. It's a system. The roof is a system. The foundation is a system. It's all designed to keep water out of it. It's designed to preserve your lifestyle. And he gets to get in this whole like amazing speech. The guy was very into right. his job. But I do think about systems like that. And this is a system. These mounds are a system with the ditch right. and the fish right. and the fish die and they make the soil fertile. And then you dig the soil out and you put it on the mound and the mound preserves heat. It's really fascinating. Right. So, And you can also eat the fish. These are really yes. deep... Here's what's interesting. I think some of these channels may still survive. And if I'm not mistaken, some of these channels still have fish in them. Yeah. So again, our friend Case, our mutual friend Case here, he tried something. It was a hobby kit or whatever, where you have a bunch of goldfish and then you have uh, 
I can't remember what he did. He he gave it up after a while, but it's a system where you have these uh, brown, weird earth pellets and something, yeah. <laughs> and the fish would uh, live in the water. They poop and create fertilizer that actually grows the plants that are right. seeded in this uh, weird brown earth he had. So it's a system. It's a loop and a system, and it's very clever, but that's how you get a population of that size. 40,000 people in a city of uh, of antiquity, half a million people in a valley. This is a high plain grass valley yeah. near the mountains. One quick thing before we forget, one quick thing I wanted to mention that I found fascinating, and I, I don't want to even blow it here, but for some reason with the mountains surrounding it, this place is protected from earthquakes. The people pointing to destruction of this place and thinking that, oh, it was a massive earthquake, right? Like, well, not with this place. But anyway, my point being is that you can only grow that size of a population, especially back then, if you can feed everybody. This is not a hunting and gathering situation. No, no. This is a settled down agriculture situation like they think might have taken place at Gebekli Tepe. Yeah. And if you'll remember, folks, if you have not listened to that, the, the reason that they think that all sprang up, the birth of agriculture, is that when you have several hundred hunter-gatherers all gathered in one place... You got to feed them. And therefore, you can't all just go out hunting every day because that's that's a lot of time. The meat doesn't keep resources. Right. Yes. You're busy building that. Again, a big mystery. How do you got 19 to 22 ton stone slabs cored from somewhere else, brought over, carved, and standing up in a ceremonial monument. So that was the birth of agriculture, they think now, because you have that many people there, but you have to feed them. So in this case, they figured out a clever way that's not really seen in too many other areas where they were able to channel this water in, dig these really deep ditches, have the system going. And that's the thing is that you you don't tire out the soil. You can scoop it up from the bottom again, where it's rich with nutrients and and pile that on top of the mound and keep growing. So it's a, it's this great system. But anyway, that's how you grow a population to that size back then, which was pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's really crazy because I think it's a little over nine miles from the yeah. lake. I actually heard 12 at one point. Of course, the water line seems to be moving around a lot, but this is a, a significant engineering feat. And I also seem to remember somewhere else in our research that they had waterproof drainage systems in the area mm. that, you know, a whole other level of engineering, which we'll get to later. Right. It is fascinating, and it was a very sophisticated settlement for the time period. The site is so magnificent, <laughs> as Dr. Barnhart says, it inspires a lot of wonder and awe and a lot of questions. And there's a lot of fiction, of course, that pops up with a subject like this. And so he addresses some Speculation. of Speculation. Yeah, well, you don't know how they, they did it. So to a lot of people's minds, like, it had to be aliens. Yes. Or, you know, there was a uh, human technology that was so superior that's been lost. And where did that come from? And how was it deployed? And where did it go? And some of the evidence that remains is is so incredible when you take a close look at it that people, the only thing they can come to for a conclusion is that maybe aliens were involved. And again, that's not to say in every case that people are thinking that people weren't that smart back then or they weren't capable. It's just that this is such an out-of-bounds leap for what was going on in other places at the time. Is there something special about this one place? Did they how how were they able to leap ahead? Now, personally, Scott and I are both more of a mind of of the lost technology angle on this. And that yeah. I'm gonna give away my hand right away. I'm just gonna say that so far I haven't seen any inscriptions with UFOs or alien heads on them, like you might see an emoji, but I do believe that ancient peoples had technology that they developed and somehow it is lost and, and that it would be mind blowing and amazing, but within a style context of that is contemporary of their time. So I'm saying that uh, they didn't have like television, but I guess what I'm saying is if you look at the Atlanteans and what some people believe is that they had a global communication system of some kind based on powered crystals or whatever, that it's not going to look like your flat screen TV so much or your iPad. You make a good point there. It's equally fascinating. It's like if you did find some writing and they said, well, we used to sit around and watch TV. Right. You would say, what? Okay. How was that working? Yeah. How did that work? So there is something interesting about 
the idea of a sophisticated technology that is lost. Not right. saying anything about aliens or spaceships. And of course, right. you know, we have the long history of our show of when we get to theories and explanations, we run the gamut from like the mundane to the fringe and back sure. again. So, you know, we'll have to touch on that because uh, Giorgio Suclos has an episode on this place, <laughs> on ancient yeah, aliens. Right. And uh, there was a lot of stuff in it that was compelling. Frankly, the least compelling part of it to me was the alien part. Right. But there's other stuff that's really fascinating. There are some questions that it's just so hard to figure out. So we'll, we'll right. get around to that in part two. But the level of technology is really sophisticated. And when you say, oh, this is sophisticated, we're not saying, oh, you couldn't do that because you're yeah. X, Y, or Z. We're just saying this is impressive. Right. It's impressive no matter when it was. Even if you did it right now today, it would be impressive if you yeah, built exactly. this place. Exactly. Well, look, we don't know how Ed Lead Scalman really <laughs> transported his coral rock carvings or, or what he did. That's a mystery. We don't know how they transported the stones of Gobekli Tepe. We're not totally sure exactly how the stones at Stonehenge were quarried and carried those great distances, but it seems like a lot of ancient peoples knew what to do. Now, here's an example. At Tiwanaku, you know, these structures are so advanced that, again, they leave people wondering. There are stones there that range from 30 tons to 130 tons. So a yeah. single standing stone or a single, let's say, separated stone can weigh 130 tons. Now, for comparison, this comes from the uh, academic journal in Heritage Science titled Sustainability Problems of the Giza Pyramids by Syed Hamada and Algrib Sonbol. They say, for calculations, most Egyptologists use 2.5 tons as the weight of an average pyramid stone block. 8,000 tons of granite were imported from the Aswan located more than 800 kilometers away. The largest granite stones in the pyramid, found above the king's chamber, weigh 25 to 80 tons each. Now, that's pretty impressive because they had to lift them that high. So an 80-ton stone, to get it up that high, and of course, there's uh, theories of ramps. They floated them up there. A lot of people have different theories. Ed Lee Scallon himself, of Coral Castle fame, said famously that he knew how it was done because that's how he transported and levitated his stones, whatever you want to believe about him. It's a interesting conundrum, an archaeological historical puzzle. But again, in comparison, one of the largest stones at the king's chamber at the pyramids, Egypt, 80 tons. Here, 130 tons. Oh, by the way, and the second largest stone is 85 tons. But right. here's let's go back to the 130 tons. I was just quickly doing math while you were talking right now. I wanted to look this up. The 131-ton stone that's at the site weighs a little bit more than half the weight of a 747. It's 65% of the weight of a 747 aircraft. Right. Which just begs all these questions about how did you move it? And of course, there's a lot of theories about this. And there's there's always some, <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, it was it was the Leeds Scallon episode when we covered the Coral Castle, uh -huh. one of our earlier shows, not as early as it was supposed to be. It was actually a running joke for a while, how long it took us to get to it. But when we did cover it, I remember there was a contractor, remember that somewhere yeah, in Georgia yeah, or somewhere, yeah. who had proven, I think, lever and fulcrum ways to move large stone blocks and he was like this is how i would do it and his right. family we actually reached out to them and they were like yeah he's tired of talking about it and so he <laughs> wouldn't do an interview but there's videos of him on youtube doing that yeah, yeah him and other people walking large items using a system of ropes so it can be done but if that actually applies in this case i'm not so sure i just know that people can do amazing things using leverage yes. and uh, fulcrums ropes this and that and then we're gonna have to revisit this because it's uh, it's gonna be a point in comparison to the stones that were found at Pumapunku, but getting back to the Egyptian pyramid stones, the paper goes on to say, or the abstract does, about 500,000 tons of mortar was used in the construction of the Great Pyramid. Many of the casing stones and inner chamber blocks of the Great Pyramid were fit together with extremely high precision. Same thing at Pumapunku. Based on measurements right. taken on the northeastern casing stones, the mean opening of the joints is only 0.5 millimeters wide, one fiftieth of an inch. So very tight tolerances. Scott and I appreciate that because we like cars and very narrow gaps on your pieces fitting together. That is the sign of good <laughs> yeah, they call craftsmanship. Those panel gaps. Yeah, yes. you don't want big ones because uh, again, things get in there. So uh, same thing here. So the people of Tiwanaku were able to figure this out as well, but maybe even more precisely. So again, what this paper says, if you don't know, the pyramids don't look, of course, back then like they do now. They're very weathered. Right. There were casing stones that had a much more smooth finish. There was a capstone at the top. 
uh, I believe, uh, made out of gold. So yeah, one of those yeah. is in a museum. You can there's one capstone that's yeah. I know at least one that's surviving. It's amazing to see if you right. look it up online. We should find it. Maybe we can find a link to that and put it in the show. Getting back to the stones at Pumapunku in Tiwanaku, people think it's impossible. Humans could have done this. Uh, the carving is so perfect. It's such a hard stone medium. You wonder how they did it. How do they fit together so perfectly? And you just don't have a conclusion where humans are a part of this for some people. Yeah. Also, the pyramids were built after this, based on the timetables that we have right now, I believe, the Egyptian pyramid, because I'm, I'm looking now at some of the oldest ones. Mm. One of them was built circa 2670 before Common Era. Uh-huh. And that would be after the dates of the construction at Pumapunku and right. in this region. It's my understanding. Well, so. here, here's another big point of contention or speculation a lot of people believe that the structures at Pumapunku are much, much older than what archaeologists would have us believe or can prove. Some people think they're as old as 15,000 years. Now you're talking older than the proposed uh, Robert Schock, I think, uh, you know, would uh, contend that the Sphinx, because of the erosion patterns near oh, the yes. base, is much, much older than people think. So again, a lot of room for debate. It's all very fascinating, but people are just coming at each other with various theories. And you look at the art and the architecture, the the structures of this, and it just doesn't seem uh, anything other than uh, from somewhere else, let's say, otherworldly. So Dr. Barnhart does admit, though, that archaeologists, they still don't know how people were able to do this. They don't know how the stones were moved. They don't know how they got them to fit together so perfectly. And also, the true age of the city is poorly understood, as he says. Again, without giving credit to, as he says, uh, to aliens or other nonsense. And of course, that's got to be the sensible approach right now, knowing what we know, rather than speculations. Unless you can prove something else, the rest is just speculation or opinions. Maybe informed opinions, but unless you have proof, it's an opinion. So what is more clear, though, to archaeologists is that the city did fall around 1000 CE. And what's interesting is that they understand its end more than they understand at the beginning and how they were able to accomplish their feats. All right, well, you can't talk about Tiwanaku and Pumapunku without talking about the Kalasasaya. This is another location in the area, and Kalasasaya means a standing up stone or stopped stones. Mm -hmm. And as we said before, researchers have discovered hundreds of buried homes, so it's a residential area around here, and a major irrigation network, which would have supported the large population that has been mentioned as being present there. Now, the Kalasasaya is thought to have been built anywhere from the year 200 BCE to 200 Common Era. Mm -hmm. And it is another low man-made platform mound, keeping in mind again that this area is a large flat plain with no trees uh, for the most part. I mean, there's minor hills and things like that. But it has high sandstone pillar walls, which are not original. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And a large central sunken court, Uh like we talked about at Chauvin and in other parts of Tiwanaku. Now, the Tiwanaku Empire extended, as we said earlier, from the Lake Titicaca Basin into Peru and Chile, and it was the dominant civilization when it was present. And uh, we actually have found some maps of it. It's it's pretty fascinating, because when you look at Pumapunku, Pumapunku was aligned towards the water, towards the lake, but it's hard to know where the water line was when it was built. There are some folks that speculate that this was originally a port city and that the lake was a lot closer to it, closer to these temples and these uh, ceremonial areas. And th- because right now, as we said, it's nine or 10 miles away. So it's hard to imagine that. But again, there's a lot of fluctuation going on with the lake levels, apparently. So in exploring how the Kalasasaya area was excavated by various archaeologists over the years, we came across a book called Ancient Titicaca, The Evolution of Complex Society in Southern Peru and Northern Bolivia. This was published in 2003 by Charles Stanish. And there's some really fascinating stuff in here that details the progression of archaeology, not only at the site, but archaeology itself from a historical standpoint, based on when the site was originally discovered and the methodologies in the early days of it and how those progressed. And it's something that Forrest alluded to earlier. There are trends within the approaches that the archaeologist takes. 
they seem to come and go. They ebb and flow. Initially, when they got there, they didn't have the benefit of carbon dating. So there was a lot more trying to get into the heads of the folks that built these structures and figure out what they thought and what their goals were. And there was probably a lot more speculation. Then as time went on, these other archaeologists came into the picture in the later decades and they said, look, all we can do here is scientific method. Let's be very official about this. We're going to dig in certain places. We're going to go down into the strata and we're going to get much more precise about the type of research we were doing. And some of the things that they did at this particular site was that they would go down and they would find remnants. They would find pottery and they would find sections of artwork and ash that would tell them something about the folks that were there at that particular time. Then they would find another section that they would call pristine. So it was like an area Mm -hmm. where there wasn't necessarily continuous occupation. And then under that, they would find something else. And through decades and decades and different approaches of archaeologists that became more and more sophisticated from a scientific standpoint, but also varied from a, I guess you would say, a spiritual approach or a an approach that really takes into account some of the things that might have been going on there. And we'll be talking about hallucinogenics and that sort of thing Ooh. as we move forward. Yeah. <laughs> when you can get into all that stuff, you know, there's a difference between saying, okay, well, here's this. I'm going to brush the dirt off here. Mm-hmm. I found this. This means this X, Y, and Z. This happened at, in this time period. And now carbon dating comes into the picture. And we can figure all these things out and make a table of time and different timelines for, it's my understanding from that book, there are two types of timelines that they try to develop. One is evolutional in terms of what's happening to the people from an evolutionary standpoint. And then the other one has more to do with cultural developments. And uh, those progress at different levels. So they're able to make a lot of conclusions there. But one of the things about Kalasasaya is that, or Kalasasaya Forest, which way am I supposed to say? I (laughs) believe... (laughs) <laughs> Dr. Bernhardt, yeah. I think he says, Kalasasaya. Kalasasaya. Okay. Let's come back to the dimensions of this place. The, yeah. the, the interesting thing about it is that it's it's about 400 feet by 425 feet, mm-hmm. which means it's not perfectly square. But the other thing to consider is that all of these sites apparently have been essentially disassembled and reassembled over and over, and it's not clear by who. Yeah. In some cases, it might have been the culture's over centuries occupying the territory. In other cases, it might have been folks coming along later trying to turn it back into a tourist site or something, reconstructing things. So maybe it was perfectly square originally, right. and maybe it's not anymore. Or maybe it never was. It's hard to know. And, and that's another thing that's interesting, too. When you look at the totality of the way all the archaeology has proceeded, yeah. and you say, oh, well, they carbon dated this dirt that was underneath this particular monument or giant, you know, 120 or 130 ton stone. So now we know when that stone was put there. Yeah. Well, maybe you do, but you might not because the stones may have been moved around, which is something that we will also talk about here yeah. in a minute. So that's what's interesting. And, and then with these monoliths at this particular site, it lends itself to a more ceremonial location. Yeah. To your point, one of the mysteries, it's not ghosts or aliens, But somebody after the 1900s and before the 1960s decided to rebuild walls between these standing monoliths that surround the Kala Sasaya. Right. Which is weird. (laughs) It's baffling because they weren't there originally. So how we know that is that there are still photos and some drawings. Now, there was a gentleman, an early explorer of the site named Ephraim Squire, and he drew illustrations of the features that he found before the year 1900. And he called it South America's Stonehenge. So he drew a lot of great sketches. That's how we know a lot about it. There's also, of course, photography just after the turn of the century. And those don't have those stone walls between these monuments. Those were put in afterwards for some reason. Now, we can speculate only why, and I thought like maybe it's to just to reestablish it, uh, make it more appealing maybe for tourism, maybe just to put things back. My speculation is that the people who did it, and it could be archaeologists, it could be local folks, that they feel an ownership to it. Like this comes from our ancestors. We own this. Right. Hey, they took it down and rebuilt it, and it got destroyed and taken apart. Hundreds of years. Over right. the centuries. We can keep doing that. Yeah. Right. What's to stop us? In fact, uh, let's get all these messy stones back in order and rebuild it. And it's like, yeah, I kind of understand that. Now, from a archaeological standpoint, yeah, of course, we wish a lot of the stuff wasn't destroyed or tampered with, so you can kind of get a, a sense of what went on 
from the way that they are left. So that's been lost. But you know what? That happens. Anyway, so yeah, Ephraim Squire, he made a note of this. And what you can see from his drawings is that, yeah, it's not like it is now, which is weird. So yeah, some things have been altered and a, they weren't as they are now, but it's still no less amazing of a layout. So one of the things that is preserved, though, is that layout of the Kalas Asaya. So uh, here's an explainer, though. The dimensions of the Kalas Asaya remain intact. The orientations, the astrological alignments are also intact. The cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, that lines up so that if you are standing in the middle of it, this, this courtyard, this sunken courtyard or the center of the feature, and you look out the front entrance, I believe, which is also intact, the corners of this square mark the points of the summer and winter solstices. And the middle point, as you look out through the, uh, the opening of the gate, that marks the equinox. So that is fascinating to me, is that, of course, like a lot of these ancient sites, they had a lot of stake and stock in astronomical events, charting, movements, they paid attention to the skies. It was very important to them. And that remains at least at Calisasaya, these cardinal directions and the, the the lining up. So Professor Barnhart was there with a group at the equinox and it's freezing. So <laughs> but his takeaway yes. was that these people were dedicated. Whoever did this back then, this was really important to them. He also said there was no wonder they worshiped the sun. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> that's, because that's what I was going was like for. It was that, cold. Yeah, it was yeah. cold. When the sun comes up, it's, uh, it gets nice and toasty. So again, you have connections with Chavin de Huantar. In the middle of the Calcisaya is an important monument called the Ponce Monolith. Now, you you did some looking up of the uh, of the different monoliths and their names. Yeah, they're named for the archaeologists who arrived there right. in order chronologically or whoever. They, they get as, ascribed to whatever expedition yeah. did the identification of them. So that's why it's called the Ponce okay, Monolith. right. Well, that one is the biggest monolith in all of South America, the Ponce Monolith. And it shares a lot of its imagery with the Panio Stone, another uh, stone monument at Chavin. And to Dr. Barnard, uh, they look a lot alike and more so than maybe other people are willing to consider. So what's interesting is that the patio stone has a, an image of a fanged deity, twine snakes coming out of its head, holding two shells in each of its hands. The Ponce monolith is doing the same thing. It's holding two objects in each hand in front of its chest, almost pictured, I'm sure, if you're listening to this, how it's doing it very uh, blockish, I guess, in a way. The Ponce monolith also has claws on its feet and snakes on its waist and headband. So you see a lot of, uh, again, light motifs, these recurring motifs between these separate peoples, in a sense, or at least regions, but with a lot of influence back and forth of the art and the spiritual monoliths and the things that they spent a lot of time making as being sacred. So the same imagery pops up in these different places. So there's a connection, I believe, between all these places in some way. With regard to Ponce, I did want to go ahead and say that's a Bolivian archaeologist named Carlos Ponce Sanguines. Right, right. Hopefully I'm saying his last name right. I actually read an excerpt from the book I mentioned earlier. We'll have a, a link to this just quickly that tells you a little bit about the work he did there. This is on page 80 yeah. of the book. He began systematic and intensive research at Tiwanaku, directing massive excavations at the site in conjunction with the Centro de Investigaciones Archaeologicas de Tiwanaku, hmm. or CIAT. Mm -hmm. And it says here, uh, Ponce and his team excavated a substantial number of large units outside the Kalasasaya enclosure, as well as 73 units in the interior of the structure. Yeah. One of the objectives of Ponce's Kalasasaya excavations was to discover stratigraphic levels predating the main structure, and therefore to define occupations prior to what Bennett, who was a, a preceding archaeologist, right. had discovered. Right, right. It says here that under the platform of the main structure, he discovered two habitation levels, both below the fill of the Kalasasaya and separated by a sterile stratum. Mm -hmm. Ponce reports finding a number of intact features associated with these levels, similar perhaps to Bennett's discovery of ash pits and hearths. So it goes on through, he developed a chart, a time chart, mm -hmm. and he published 16 dates for what he called Tiawanaku 1, Tiawanaku 2, and those range from 580 B.C., to uh, 320 AD with a margin of 100 to 200 years. And then he derived an average date of 237 BC for Tiawanaku 1. Yeah. And 43 AD for Tiawanaku 2. This is, I'm reading from the book. 
So he came up with these whole series of phases that it went through, and it went through uh, five phases total. Mm -hmm. It says here in the book that the work of Bennett and Ponce, following Bennett at Tiwanaku, set the stage for research in the region for decades. Ponce's five-phase sequence for Tiwanaku was in many ways a refinement of Bennett's general chronological framework for the Titicaca region as a whole. That was the original thing, and right. I won't get, you know, it gets pretty academic, yeah. but the, the bottom line is the early days were Tiwanaku 1 and 2, and then by 4 and 5, they, they were saying that was when it was, the civilization was getting more sophisticated and almost imperial before it collapsed. Right, so, right, right, In about the year 1000. You wonder, like, would it be great to go back in time and uh, visit these places? And I would say, this one's a little scary to me. Yeah, not just for the yeah. fact that of, of the dismembering and a lot of uh, dismembering of, and beheadings of, let's say, guests, whether you intended on <laughs> being a guest or not, or were just a captured enemy, and you ended up. Uh, I'm having an old friend for dinner. Exactly, and uh, he just <laughs> happens to be one of the prisoners we got uh, in a in a war raid. Whatever your case was. It can be dangerous there, but interesting. So here's, we're coming up on this uh, thing that I noticed that uh, was mentioned uh, by Dr. Barnhart in that it's another connection to Shavin, what we see at the Kala Sasaya, and that's the feature of what they call the mortise heads. Now, the sunken rectangular courtyard is pretty similar to the one you see at Shavin. Which, how far north again was Chavin? Well, Chavin de Huantar to Pumapunku, and, and I just Googled, you know, that digital line, you can do the, as the crow flies. Right. How expression. do I get there? <laughs> yeah, that's 770 miles. That's a straight yeah, line. Yeah, okay. Where it's about 1,239 kilometers. So, a little ways okay. away, a bit of a walk, and that's why you think these cultures probably didn't have much influence. But then again, we're seeing a lot of similarities here. Well, here's an interesting idea I had based on what they think that the, the heads meant. So what I'm going to say here about the tenon heads, not the mortise, I'm just thinking mortise and tenon, you know, the, the joints. Oh, yes, yes. You've seen some decoration. They call these the tenon heads. So in the square blocks that are pretty well tightly fitted, they will make one block and it's got basically one end of the block has a carved head in it or some kind of figurine. And they place that within the wall. So as uh, you see the low wall of the sunken court, there are these heads that stick out. Now, one of the prevailing ideas about the Kalasasaya courtyard heads, <laughs> these tenon heads, is that they are the Titicaca Valley lineage leaders, that they're the ancestors, they're venerated here, they're likenesses. But this same sort of thing, these heads, are seen at Chavin. So... Professor Barnhart wonders, like, well, why are you just assuming that they are the ancestors' lineage when they could represent people undergoing various states of transformation? Now, I had this thought, this is just mine, that if these people, and it seems like, here's another interesting factoid, we're, well, we're just going to mention it later during the culture section, but it seems, I think from analyzing the mummified remains of their dead, people from all levels of society, babies to the elderly, everybody seemed to have psychoactive drugs in their system. And so the theory is that it wasn't so much for recreation, but it was a spiritual thing that was expected of people in the society, that you just did that to develop and transform oneself in a spiritual sense. And so could these heads, because if you look at them, some of them have very garish expressions, you could say, almost like uh, the gargoyles above the uh, the dental building or whatever, where they're just twisted faces and they're kind of scary and spooky. These are just, I noticed, are contorted a little. Perhaps they could represent people undergoing the processional spiritual aspect of these sites because it, they were meant to be experienced by people walking through and possibly tripping their lids off. <laughs> in a sense that, again, it's supposed to be a very spiritual experience, and who knows what your face looks like, you know, contorted, or could be imagined by these people. That's what I wonder. And so, again, these are, they don't have paintings to represent these various phases and what you might go through. So imagine a Halloween horror house, right? And there are yes. scary paintings on the wall of, you know, goblins and pumpkins and this and that. And so as you walk through it, you're meant to take that in. And here, as you walk through this or participate in the courtyard area, you were meant to see these as to be representational of other people's and perhaps your own spiritual transformation. Just a thought. 
One of the coolest things at all of these sites is actually at Kalasasaya, and that's the Puerta del Sol, or the gateway to the sun, or the sun gate. Yeah. And this is a pretty fascinating structure when you look at it. It's an, it's very monumental. It makes you think of a an ancient and much smaller version of the Arc de Triomphe or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It has the same sort of structure to it. It has a connection, again, to the Chauvin site, which is something we're going to talk about here in a second. But the other thing that's interesting about it is is that it's not in its original position where it was originally found. From the early discoveries of the area, there are actually there's actually a photo of it it's still standing, but it's it's broken at the top, which is and it's obviously still broken, but it's broken and and much more deformed. It's not really properly aligned. And it's also significantly buried at its base in sediment. And now it's on a flat platform at the Calcisaya, and it's straightened up a little bit. The big crack in it is still there. So at some point it got moved. It wasn't moved in antiquity. It was moved since the site has been discovered. And no one seems to really know how or when that happened. One of the things that Professor Barnhart or Dr. Barnhart points out in his Wondrium lecture on this is that when he was there, it was easy for him, at least, to tell where the sun gate came from. Because back at Pumapunku, there were two or three, I can't remember, I think there was two other sun gates on the ground laying sideways that matched this one. Yeah, I think three others that... Three others, right. The idea is that one was placed, again, I think probably at these cardinal directions, to entrances of the area. And the right. other three were on the ground in disarray, not as excavated as well or restored as well, and were shape. But they were there. So you can say like, well, maybe that's where they took it from. Right. And I don't know what the weight of this thing is. It's not the heaviest block there. But sometime in more recent times, it got moved over there and stood up and sort of realigned and the question is why and Forrest and I were conjecturing off the air. Maybe it was for tourism reasons or for, or like you said, maybe the local cultures are like, well, let's try to rebuild this a little bit. But the interesting thing is, and I can't remember the exact distance between Pumapunku and the Kalasasaya. I think it's a half mile or six tenths of a mile or something, or it's a good ways for, to move a big stone like that. You know, I, I think I noted that somewhere and however much of a distance, it's quite impressive that alone for any people yes. of any time, <laughs> which <Yeah. laughs> who don't have uh, massive diesel cranes at their disposal. I don't know how they did that. And that was done right. more recently. But here's an interesting observation, though, from Dr. Barnhart, and that uh, he's aware of how slowly the soil accumulates in that area, being a high plain area. There is erosion or whatever, but it's not like you're getting huge deposits of silt burying everything. Right. So it, it, things get buried very slowly, but this was buried so deeply. It makes them wonder, is this whole site older than what they think? Right. Again, it's just that it was so buried and, and broken and it was unearthed that it had been there for a very long time. So that's another mystery. So yeah, he believes it came from Pumapunku and the three remaining gates are there and they're in much worse condition. But he wants to be clear, Tiwanaku is not a carbon copy, as he says, of Chavan. It's just that there's cultural influences. And so again, this is the reason we're pointing this out is it paints a picture that the Tiwanaku people were not from outer space. They were influenced and developed in a relatable fashion, we think it seems, to the other Yaya Mama lake cultures and they all developed together but here's the weird thing the timelines are you have huge gaps possibly of thousands of years but things are similar and things continue to this day that are echoes of those types of cultural influences so that's what's weird is that this place is uh, it's kind of out of time in a weird way and it does add an aura of that mystery because you look at the architectural feats and that seems maybe futuristic. And maybe they did have technology, we're going to talk about in part two, of how to make the stuff that would blow people's minds back then. But it was only known to the, the peoples of the lower lake region. And again, what he wants to make clear is that there are connections here that seem obvious, but a lot of academics don't make those connections because they you're trying to be very conservative and not step over your bounds with some outlandish theories. I'm sorry. What else were you going to say about the sun gate? 
<laughs> well, I was just going to say, yeah, because I, I was wondering how far apart they right. were. We still, and nobody seems to know how it got moved to the Kalasasaya from Pumapunku. But the artwork on the Sun Gate, the iconography yeah. is common, or it has some common ground with right. Chauvin, as you said. Again, not a carbon copy. But you see this character at the top of it who is the sun god, or they refer to him as the sun god. But when you look closely at his head, you see these rays coming out. And this is, we were talking earlier about this, about the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Is that rays of the sun or is it snakes? Because it does look kind of like snakes. And there are clearly snakes yeah. coming out from the belt. Right. Another thing that Professor Barnhart points out on one of the monoliths is that there's claws at the feet. Right. right. But that same monolith has snakes on the belt and snakes in the headdress. Yeah. So this symbolism is common to uh, Chavin. Right. It's not exactly the same but it is similar. So that's what the sun gate is. And one of the earliest archaeologists, I pause, Nansky, I believe his name was, uh, and we'll come uh, to him at more in part two because he was early on. He seemed to think there was a calendar on the front uh, of the sun gate. Right. But Professor Barnhart never mentioned that, and I haven't seen it in the more current stuff, so I think some people must have thought that Poznansky was not necessarily right about that. But what's interesting is that a lot of Poznansky's theories have been discarded by modern archaeologists right. because he didn't have the tools before him that they have now. Yeah. I don't know that that necessarily means that they should have been discarded, though. Right. Again, that's something to talk about later. Now, Forrest, you know, I've been back east over two years mm -hmm. now. And I mean, you know me. I've moved a lot in my lifetime, back and forth, L.A., yeah. New York, back to L.A., back home to North Carolina. And I've gotten pretty good at it, or you would think so. But after two years, you know what I was still working on until we got our latest sponsor? Well, for me, it would be unpacking that last box. Well, yeah, there, there's still that box over in the corner. But no, <laughs> right. this is finding doctors. Oh, it's a yeah. freaking nightmare because yep. you're basically starting over. And if you're of a certain age like me, you don't just have that one doctor you see when you get a cold. You got mm. a lot more. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of at sea when you get somewhere new. You're asking your friends, who do they go to, stuff like that. But you can't always trust that either. That's where ZocDoc comes in. ZocDoc is a free app that shows you doctors who are patient-reviewed take your insurance, and are available when you need them. With ZocDoc, you can read up on local doctors, get verified patient reviews, and see what other real humans had to say about their visit. So when you walk into that doctor's office, you're set up to see someone in your network who gets you. Yeah, and you don't have to be moving to need new doctors. All kinds of things can come up. They retire, they move on, they're always busy. So look, do as I did. Just go to ZocDoc.com, choose a time slot, and whether you want to see the doctor in person or do a video visit, and and just like that, you're booked. You can find the doctor that's right for you and book an appointment that works for your schedule. Every month, millions of people use ZocDoc, and I'm one of them. It's now my go-to whenever I need to find and book a doctor. In the chaotic world of healthcare, let ZocDoc be your trusted guide to find a quality doctor in a way that is surprisingly pain-free. Get your docs in a row. Go to ZocDoc.com legends and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot -O -C com slash legends. ZocDoc dot com slash legends. Today's episode is brought to you by Simply Safe Home Security. And speaking of which, Scott, you remember how many, <laughs> many, many years ago now when you had a smart home? Oh, yeah. Don't remind me. Don't. That was not good. That was not good. <laughs> well, what do you, why not, man? I thought it was pretty cool. I, I was a little envious, actually, that you could do all those home tricks from your smartphone. You know, raise and lower the blinds, adjust the AC, lock the doors, uh, set the alarm or turn it off for a guest. Or Yeah, I know it sounds cool, but it cost a fortune. Mm. I had a thing the size of a refrigerator in a closet that I couldn't <laughs> work on. Whenever anything went wrong, I had to wait two weeks for some other guy to come fix it, too. You know, these days... I can do all that security stuff with my smartphone and my Simply Safe system. Look, I'm sure we would all like to know what's happening at our homes when we're not there. Uh, but many of you probably think you got to spend a ton of money and a lot of hassle to keep an eye on your place and your family and property safe. But you don't anymore. You just need Simply Safe and their new wireless outdoor camera. We love this setup because you can see on your phone what's going on outside at your place and, and you get an alert whenever anyone approaches. Man, do I wish Simply Safe was around when I got broken into years ago. 
I would love to see who did it. I wouldn't want you to get all John Wick on no, him. But, uh, no, no, of course not. Uh, Simply Safe has everything anyone needs to keep their home safe these days, and, and you don't need a smart home to do it. You can get the indoor outdoor cameras, sensors for entry, smoke, water damage, freeze warning, they got it all. And, and Simply Safe is monitored 24 7 by professionals ready to dispatch police, firefighters, or EMTs to your home the second anything happens. Simply Safe is less than a dollar a day and you can set it up in around 30 minutes. There's no long-term contracts or commitments. Honestly, I rest a lot easier these days knowing I have an affordable and effective security solution with Simply Safe. You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com/al. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash A-L. I'm Alex, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. All right, so let's now talk about the actual site of Pumapunku as a archaeological site. Well, the temple complex of Pumapunku and its people predated the Inca, who were so impressed with the ruins they found 500 years later after it was abandoned that they considered the holy site must have been where the gods created the world. So it's thought that the construction of Pumapunku started sometime between 500 and 600 current era CE and was built and rebuilt over hundreds of years, expanding its population as it did, but then for some yet fully known or unknown reason, its inhabitants quickly left. When the Inca came along, because there was not a continuous occupation, right. uh, and this is something I've learned about as we've been researching mm -hmm. this, they're having to make assumptions about how it was built or why it was built right. before they came along. And that, and so they decided, well, this must be a holy site. It's clearly, there was a lot going on here, even, but we're not, we're unable to gather any of the information about why it was made or how it was made. But right. It sure is cool, <laughs> so we're going, it's going to be venerated for us, you know. Yeah, before we started uh, rolling again after a pause, we were talking about the timeline of the different civilizations. Right. The great and tremendous civilizations that have existed throughout Mesoamerica, the Mexico area of today, to South America, all the way now, they believe, into the American Southwest, this huge swath of territory and all the civilizations that came but it's a little confusing to people because people want to know, like, well, who came first? The Maya, the the Olmec, the Inca? So uh, there's a great knowledgenuts.com article. Not going to read from it, but basically I found one thing because we were talking earlier tonight about what they called themselves, and we don't know. So it's the same thing with the Olmec. The Maya came first. They're the most ancient, and they lived, uh, geez, what, 25... 2600 BCE is when uh -huh. they, they think they started first mapping their settlements and just them living. Yeah, 2600 BC, as it says here in the article. And they lasted the longest out of all of them and were perhaps the greatest Mesoamerican civilization. But they were heavily influenced by the younger Olmec generation that started after them. And it wasn't until the Olmecs flourished that the Maya started building their great cities. The Olmec, they're often forgotten. <laughs> they're the least popular. Yeah. Everybody knows the, the, name, the, the names Maya, Inca, and Aztec, but they often forget the Olmec. And they are the ones who carved those mysterious nine-foot-tall, massive stone heads with African features. We're their ancient sailors that came and visited them. And to venerate them, they, they carved these stones. But my point here is that the Olmec, we don't know what they called themselves. We only know the word Olmec from Aztec writings much, much later. Right. So, yeah, it, it's like the, the Tiwanaku peoples, we're really not sure. They didn't leave much behind. So you only have to go by what the Inca told uh, the Spanish and vice versa. There you go. It's often passed down. We don't know for sure, but uh, they're not around to criticize us. So we're going to have to go with the Tiwanaku people. So let's talk now about what the site was like. So this terraced mound of Pumapunku was larger than two football fields placed side by side. On the east and west sides were courtyards paved with massive stone slabs along a central promenade, and the walls were of red sandstone that had geometrically carved designs. The enormous size of these stones, as we said before, and along with how precisely these stones were laid, cut, fitted together, 
like interlocked puzzle pieces or, or Legos, is a major part of the enduring mystery of Pumapunku. That and how the site seems to have been destroyed uh, quickly or dismantled or geologically disturbed by some catastrophe. So in general, Pumapunku is maybe most well known for its large-scale megalithic construction. But it was a, a bit of a palace, temple, but also an elite residential complex, which I thought it was interesting. It's like that's where the the haves lived and who the ones yeah. who dictated what was going to happen. So your officials, your Including maybe your high the priests. sacrifices. <laughs> this could like, explain why it failed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like yes. here in LA, they're the ones who have the, the penthouse suites at the Americana and the rest of us are just shopping below at the what's yeah, those pretzels. Exactly. And, and they're right. the ones looking down and everything and making sure it all goes okay. But it seemed to work out for them for a while. But anyway, I just thought it was interesting that it was also thought to now have been a residential place. People actually lived there. It wasn't just a place to visit. So with the excavations at Pumapunku, they've been finding rich ceramics and really high quality crafts within it. And also evidence of massive feasting. Feasting seems to be very important then with this village and society. So now the thing about the stones and the architecture is that they're not just perfectly fitted, okay? There's evidence though that there's metal clasps that held the stones together, keeping them very tight. But essentially, imagine the a capital letter I that's with a serif, right? So it's got the, the the top wedge or the top line at the top of the letter I, and then the the bottom line at the uh, the bottom of the letter. That goes across the seam of two stones, right? Right. And then what they do is pour hot molten metal into that sunken T, and when it hardened, it's like a an ingot that goes to both sides of the stone, and it keeps them tight together. Now, they think that most of those have either been stolen, rotted away, destroyed. There's not much evidence of that, but they're pretty sure that's what was happening, at least with some of these stones, and keeping them very tight together. So, uh, yeah, they're poured into eye shapes. Scott, you had a, a, a reference to a sailing hatch lever. Yes. Uh, when you dog a hatch down on a sailboat and the uh, there are certain uh, boats that where the hatches, it's recessed because you don't want to trip on it if you're right. on the deck or whatever. And they call that a dog clamp. Ah, this yeah. is the same thing that they call it in the terms of these stones. It's a dog clamp where it's used to bind the stones together through uh, friction mm -hmm. and uh, a similar um, recessed housing that the metal can sit in on both sides of the stone and right. hold them together. So right. it creates like a joint that's locked together. Very cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't wait till we uh, dive into that. And and, uh, and we'll have pictures for at least part two. Right. Why don't you tell us about the Andean cross? This is the cross that everybody who has ever considered uh, going into a gift shop <laughs> in <laughs> Bolivia yeah. or anywhere that yeah. celebrates the Inca right. uh, thinks it's an, an Inca symbol, but it's not. It yeah. actually predates the Inca, and we know this because it was it was found in the Acapana Pyramid, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Mm -hmm. There was an Andean cross in the floor in the Acapana Pyramid, uh, and we know that it was there at one point, but it's been looted so many times it's gone now. Right. So, But that proves that it was part of the Tiwanaku complex, yeah. which was built 500 years before the Incans, which means it is not an Incan symbol. Now, they've certainly adopted it, and they have every right, right to. There's nothing sure. wrong with that because they're related to those ancestors that came before them. Right. But it, it's a mistake to think that it originated in the Incan culture. It originated in cultures that were upstream of them, which yeah. is pretty fascinating. We've all seen them. If you want to know what we're talking about, it's just basically a kind of a fat plus sign. Yeah. And we've seen it. Uh, they make cool jewelry out of it. I guess if you uh, uh, if you go there to Bolivia and you, you buy some of these, there's somewhat two colors and there's a meaning to that. And that's the evolution of culture. But just know that it didn't start with them. It started in Tiawanaco. Right. The other thing that's interesting, too, as uh, to Forrest's point about the residential elite areas, that obviously when you have elite areas, you have not so elite areas. <laughs> right. And there is proof of those as well. So there was a class structure mm -hmm. and a hierarchy to the folks that were living in Pumapunku, in the Pumapunku area, which, mm -hmm. again, is a subset of Tiawanaku. So there's a lot of economic diversity, and when you get to the future part of this where you're speculating what might have caused it to collapse, right. maybe maybe it was some sort of class warfare or reason eh? that uh, maybe that's what brought it down. We don't know that. It's pure speculation. Right. But also, when you mix that in with uh, something that Forrest mentioned earlier, the widespread use of hallucinogenic mm -hmm. <laughs> drugs, 
that was part of the lifestyle and culture there combined with these different strata of folks that haves and the have nots. It's, right. it's hard to know. And then all the sacrifices. Well, <laughs> it sounds like a potentially dangerous system <laughs> you, uh, well, you <laughs> wonder, from you, a culture you, standpoint. You, yeah. I don't know. No, it's like, look, with all, uh, you know, respecting their ways, the ancients, it's like we wouldn't put up with sacrifices these days. And I can nah. imagine back then it's like, no, no, it's a great honor. Come on. You want to do this? And it's like, I, I don't know. I, I you know. Right. And it could have just been, it could have been something much more uh, simple, right, like um, right. environmental disaster of some kind. So, so uh, uh, then tell us about the moat that I'd never heard of. This is surprising information. I guess there was a moat that surrounded the inner part of the city. You can't see it anymore, but there is evidence that it was there. Mm. And that was all connected back to the irrigation, which uh, was part of the raised right. mounds that we talked about earlier in that system of agriculture. So it was, you know, it's a pretty complex system, very impressive system of agriculture and water and, right. and um, plumbing, for lack of a better yeah, word. Irri <laughs> yeah, no irrigation. Plumbing. And uh, because a city of that size, you got to do something with the waste and you got to bring water yeah. to people. Speaking of that, this was interesting, I thought, in the lecture from Dr. Barnhart. He calls it a crazy idea, but listen to this. Uh, so he says, with Lake Titicaca, you have the Grande, the northern bigger section of it, and the Pequeño, which is the lower section of Lake Titicaca, north and south. Pequeño is in the south. Grande is in the north, and in between these two sections, you have a very narrow strait called the Strait of Tequina, and it seems straighter, he thinks, than natural geography and weather and erosion would lay that out. You know what I'm saying? It, it just looks it looks a little odd. When you look at it on Google Earth, it does appear to right. be pretty straight for a naturally occurring strait. Right. So imagine <laughs> picturing the larger section, the Grande part of Lake Titicaca, and at the bottom is a very narrow strip of kind of like two points that come together, but they don't actually meet. Now, did they meet at some point earlier on? And so he wonders, Dr. Barnhart, is it possible that the Tiwanaku cut that street of Tequina and at what time it was just a big lake? And so it was a, this would be a massive construction project for these people, but they seem to be capable of that. Maybe they cut this channel. And what that would do is that it flooded the southern valley of Lake Titicaca. What it does is it brings the water and the lake closer to them and their settlement and their projects. Very handy. Just quickly, I'm measuring it, the length of the channel mm -hmm. right now on Google Earth, and that would have been about a three mile straight to dig. Yeah. So a lot of digging, but you know, uh, yeah. they accomplished some other major feats, and it would have been very advantageous to spend that amount of time and labor on that to have that happen because now you get uh, all the resources of this uh, beautiful lake closer to you. You don't have to travel as far. Plus, right. it could tie in with your massive irrigation system. But now you're going to have to have an understanding of possibly coffer dam construction. It takes right. you right back to Oak Island. Yeah. <laughs> coffer dams yeah. or, or dams in general so that you can work and keep it dry until right. you're ready to flood it and move on. Yeah, and that last move piece. Stages. Right. From an engineering standpoint, it's very complex. So they certainly could have done it. But I don't know if they found any proof of uh, that that happened. But again, no. when you look at it, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Barnhart. It sure seems plausible. Another interesting aspect I want you to tell us about is is one of my favorite features of this whole area, and it's the Acapana Pyramid. Yeah, that's the biggest building at the site. Mm -hmm. They're not really sure exactly what it represents, but it, it, yeah. it probably was built in about the year 500 AD. It's um, about 115 feet tall, like a lot of the pyramids. It has terraces or tiers, it has seven of them. But, you know, sadly, the pyramid has been subjected to a lot of looting over the years, as this whole site has, which is just a tragedy because there's so much information has been lost there. Well, it caved it in. It, it, it yeah. was a sunken court, and now it's just a big dirt pit because so yeah. many people have been picking at it over the centuries. And then all those pieces, you know, where are they? Are they, are they in another house that's collapsed uh, 500 years ago? I mean, who knows? <laughs> it's such a bummer. They're going to show up on <laughs> Antiques Roadshow, and it's like, yes, well, this is an actual... Uh, <laughs> Tiwanaku artifact, and it's worth a million dollars, and you've been keeping your car keys in it. Yeah, exactly. But the thing about the Acapana Pyramid is that there were a lot of large monoliths there, some yeah. of them weighing up to 10 tons. And on top of that, some of them are apparently magnetized, yeah. which is crazy. So you get near them with a compass, the compass will lose track of right. true north, which is interesting. And, and they don't really know why or how they got magnetized. And why just some of them? Yeah. Why not have one that was prominent or at the entrance or something that you wanted to demonstrate? Yeah. So nobody, as far as we know, any of the archaeologists can figure out 
exactly why some of them were, some of them weren't, and what the purpose was. But definitely, if you take your compass up there, it starts going crazy near some of the monoliths. Yeah. So that's fascinating to me. Is it is it some part of magic trick they did back then? I mean, not magic, but like part of a demonstration that was possibly yeah. spiritual that tied in with their ceremonies there. Well, I wonder, you know, and I didn't read this anywhere, I wonder when these peoples became aware of magnetism. Good question, yeah. Were they even aware of it back then? I don't know. These are stone monoliths, so obviously it makes me think that there was something important about it to, or it could be just a coincidence that these these were like a lodestone and they happened to be magnetized and they weren't aware. But I think that these people did stuff with purpose. So another interesting thing that's also kind of creepy, under the platform in the big plaza there, caches found filled with severed heads. So yeah, big on the head thing. Well, I mean, everybody knows that makes a good foundation for your building. It, it creates natural. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, I mean, yeah. at the time the city was built, Acapana, uh, there was a population boom going in and around the city. So likely because of the raised field agriculture, it had extended way beyond this moat. And so sometime around 500 of the common era, they think this population grew to 20,000 people, maybe even 40,000 people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of mouths to feed. So yeah. in any case, up in that area, Tiwanaku, that was the only place that was doing the raised field agriculture that they know of. But there was another region that was kind of doing the same thing. And it was just down the, you could say the uh, Altiplano area to the east, it would be. And that would be the Amazon region just under Tiwanaku in Bolivia's jungle. That's a whole other story. One of the interesting things that Professor Barnhart said in his course was that the Aymara, who are the current residents of this area, don't care for trees. They see trees as evil. But then down in the Amazon, it's like all about trees. And they think not having trees is scary. So Right. It, he hates these trees. <laughs> Again, that's the Steve Martin uh, reference to the cans the assassin was trying to shoot that were near him. And he mistook yes, that for... And the idea, though, is that they believe, the Aymara people believe that if your soul was good, when you die, when you, if you're a good person, you died, your soul went up into the mountains. If you were a bad person in life, evil, your soul went into the trees. And that is a high plain, grassy plain area with no trees. And uh, right. like you said, if you, you found a tree in someone's yard, they're cutting it down. It's bad mojo. The one tree that they don't mind are eucalyptus trees because they know they're from Australia, I believe. And they can reason that. It's like, well, no, no. See, those are foreign trees. They're fine here because they probably don't have any uh, souls of bad people locked in them. So they're fine. We, we can use that wood. But anything natural here, anything indigenous? No, no. Totally opposite of the Amazonian people who worship trees. That's part of, the, there's so many of them and, and it's part of their lifestyle. They embrace trees, not the High Plains people. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about what they think the religion was like with the Tiwunaku people? This is a lot of speculation. Yeah. But a lot of it ties <laughs> back to uh, when we were talking earlier about the um, Preta del Sol mm -hmm. or the Gateway of the Sun, which depicts what appears to have a, a godlike image on the archway over the top, right. where it's either rays of light uh, coming out of its head, or it could be snakes and snakes on the belt. And there's a connection across all these cultures of that being the main deity yeah. that was worshipped going back, way back in time, all the way back to uh, an island in the lake called the Isle of the Sun, which yeah. has some of the older, oldest settlements that have been surveyed on it. There seems to be an, an idea that possibly they believe that their races, all of them, came mm -hmm. from that island, this little island. There's the mm -hmm. Isle of the Sun and the Isle of the Moon, and that possibly it all started there. And then maybe this, the worship of this particular uh, deity was brought forth to Pumapunku and Tiwanaku and, mm -hmm. and is still part of the ensuing cultures that came along. So that's something that might be happening. Yeah. Uh, we're not positive, but you can find that and uh, the Gateway of the Sun at the Kalasasaya platform, although that was not its original location. Right. It was moved over there from Pumapunku. So there was also apparently a lot of disembowelment and yep. dismembering and sacrificing going on. And uh, that seemed to all go along with 
whatever they thought was good for crops, I guess. <laughs> well, it was good. It was <laughs> good sure. for them, but it's also considered basically a punishment for their enemies. You know, if you get captured, it's like, well, that's yes. what you get for going up against us. And now that you're captured, it's a just dessert. And then you please the gods with your gift. Right. So it right. served two purposes or several. There does seem to be evidence, of course, a lot with the stone carvings, a lot of people holding the figurines or the depictions holding a, a head. And stone yes. carvings, uh, they show warriors collecting trophy skulls from prisoners. And this furthers the theory that mostly the human sacrifice was a penalty. But they also practiced mummification, the Tiwanaku. That's evidenced by deep cut marks and scratches on the bones of their deceased that they also may have been using deflushing techniques. Now, this is one of the many connections I've seen, maybe, maybe, that's been connected to, in my mind, as far as ancient practices go, to notably Gobekli Tepe. Corpses of the recently departed are believed to, by some, to have been left in open fields, if you remember. Then scavenger birds would come to clean the bones before interment or display. And remember, some of the families there had the skulls of their ancestors on display. That was actually pretty common, you know, where they would uh, fashion them with clay. They would, of course, deflush them. So you don't want the place stinking up, but you want to get the the flesh off. And then they would maybe try and recreate what they look like with clay around them and adornment and seashells for eyes. Remember that? Yeah. Well, you, you didn't have a, the Sears Portrait Center to go take a photo right. of your kids and get the wallet size and all. I don't even know if people do that anymore. <laughs> you know, back then, yeah, you didn't have paintings, but you wanted to remember your loved ones. It was a way to venerate your ancestors. And that's also one takeaway I learned in another Wonder Room course on the Celts is that being Celtic, well, one, is not really an ethnicity, but it was believed now it was more of a set of adopted social practices, art, and customs. That's maybe hard to envision for people. It's like, uh, you know, if you're from Italy and you're Italian, well, you, you have Italian customs, you like Italian food, this and that. That's brought down maybe from the Romans or the Etruscans, perhaps, or the Sicilians. But this is maybe more like being Celtic is more like being American. In that America, right. there's no ethnic Americans other than Native Americans, of course. But you can be a Native American or an imported American from Europe at some point. And eventually now, nowadays, you have American customs. So there is a thing known as being American, obviously. There is American culture. And so with Celtic culture, yeah, those are practices, but you didn't actually have to be, you know, there was no Celtic ethnicity. This is my gathering again. For my notes, I may have right. got this wrong, so I apologize. But also the Celts, yeah, they were also into skull worship. And there's another article that there was a skull cult at Gobekli Tepe. So similar practices happening all around the world, different times, but supposedly, logically, unrelated people. Yeah. Well, before we start talking about uh, other modern skulls, I just want to get this factoid in. I thought it was pretty cool. Tiwanaku is the highest ancient capital in the world. Its location makes it oddly protected from earthquakes. We learned that before. However, there have been earthquakes that have struck the region, but it doesn't seem to be the case with the Altiplano that uh, in this, this high terraced plain that they've been really affected that much by earthquakes. My jury's still a little bit out on it because right. I've seen some uncorroborated sources that indicate that earthquakes aren't really a problem there, but I've also, right. in very cursory research, seen that major earthquakes have struck within several hundred miles. Right. But living in California, that's different from them striking right at the location. So mm -hmm. there seems to be this idea that seismically, this particular area where Tiwanaku is, is kind of a protected region. We've come across yeah. that in a couple of different places. But I, I still haven't locked that down as a fact yet. So I'm, I'm a little cautious about it. Here's a little reinforcement culturally supernaturally, Scott, you're going to like this. Yeah. There's a reason the Aymara people believe that they're protected a little bit. Those Aymara people are the ones still living in the Tiwanaku Valley, and they claim they are descended from the Tiwanaku, and that's why they say they hate trees. <laughs> but and to recap that, yes, the, the good spirits depart this world, they go up in the mountains. Uh, those spirits, I believe, are called the Apus, A-P-U. Okay. Their Apu is the, the good spirits that... Uh, go up into the mountains. The bad spirits get locked into the trees, and then that's why you got to cut the trees down. So, yeah, if they see a tree, they get very nervous around them because you don't know what's locked in there, right? You're oh, just likely to cut it down. Yeah, as Professor Barnhart says, there's something about them that maybe it protects them. And 
uh, because so many other parts of the Andes are rocked by earthquakes. And the Aymaras say it's their mountains. It's their Apus that protect them. This reminds me, I have a book here uh, that was actually cited in some of our research by Paul Kudinaris. Mm -hmm. I remember when this came out, it was quite a get. It was an expensive book, uh, <laughs> photography, mm -hmm. uh, photography book called Memento Mori. Oh, yeah. And yeah. he has a whole chapter in here on this Skull Festival. And there's a lot of really freaky information about it that yeah. I think is super cool. Yeah, you showed me that book. It's it, That was a great get, man. That was uh, yeah, very Yeah, I'm, cool. I'm so glad that I got it. And when when I was when it came across it in our research, I was like, wait, I think I own this. Of course, I had to like dig it out <laughs> from the bookcase. Yeah. But it's got some great stuff in it, and I want to share it, but I'm, I'm thinking maybe not tonight because okay. it's getting a little late yeah, here in yeah. Blanket Fortiana East. I'm kind of worn out. You're also scared of skulls, I know, with, you know, with Play-Doh stuck I, to it. I know. I'm actually, I'm kind of, oh, I was thinking, uh, would my family be freaked out if I said they could have my skull after I die? Uh, I'd be okay with it. I Wouldn't might take it. Yeah, if you want to leave yeah. it to me, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to do, uh, nah, that's a good question. I promise not to stick anything on it that's not representative of you. So no uh, right. jeweled seashell eyes or Play-Doh, yeah. <laughs> like a giant Play-Doh nose or anything. I'll be respectful. But we have a lot of great stuff to talk about in part two. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Aymara Skull Festival, mm -hmm. which is truly fascinating. We're also going to be talking about some of the more uh, academic ideas of the meanings behind the monuments and the structures right. at Pumapunku and Tiwanaku from some really great papers that our researchers dug up. Um, you know, just We're just going to touch on those from the abstracts of the papers. Some really good stuff. That's a great point, Scott, is that yeah. what I want people to, to realize, because it's what we love about the story and the, the culture and the people, is that it's not just freaky, weird, giant rocks, okay, that are yes. strangely square, this meant something to people, and they still do. It's still part of their spirituality and part of the mystery and part of the religion, and it, it has meaning. And you can't remove the people and their beliefs from the rocks. It's like if you uh, if you dug up Gobekli Tepe, it's just like, okay, a bunch of weird T-shaped rocks, guy wearing a snake belt, blah, blah, blah. There's a hole in this one. They're in a circle with a bunch of trash in it. It's like, okay, well, it's old, but who cares? It's the meaning of that. The meaning that was imparted on that stone circle for those people to make that, to spend that much amount of time, you could say, who cares? But it's also the start of, uh, as far as we know so far, the start of religious monument celebration, but it also started agriculture. Why you can have your avocado toast in the morning? Because those people did that because they built that monument. That's what's important yes. to us. That's the legacy. So what are the beliefs of the Tiwanaku? What what meaning did they impart to these stones? And, and why do they spend that much time and effort, certainly a lot of effort, to do that if it was just decorative? But first, we're going to look at the why. Indeed. All right, folks, we will be back in two weeks with part two.